This one? Okay, good afternoon. I call to order our meeting on this day of Thursday, April 7th, Board of Adjustments. Call to order, and the secretary, could you call the roll, please? Sure, thank you. Okay, Hi, no Jim problem. Trescu? Here. Scott Clark? Here. Alec Hayes? Here. Alexander Candia? He's absent. Carol Fredericks? Here. Robert Cohen? Here. Carlin Williams? Here. Okay. <clears throat> Are there any changes to the uh, agenda? No changes, Chair. No changes? Someone make a motion, please. I move we accept the agenda as proposed. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Vlad Dumitrescu? Yes. Scott Clark? Yes. Alec Hayes? Yes. Ralph Fredericks? Yes. Robert Cohen? Yes. Garland Williams? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> The quasi-judicial hearing, this hearing should be conducted in accordance with the City of Delray Beach quasi-judicial rules. The applicant and the city shall be permitted to present their case. The public shall be allowed to speak for three minutes each or a maximum of six minutes if the person represents an organization or a group of people who are present but agree not to speak. The city commission board members, staff, and the applicant may be allowed to cross-examine a witness. The city or the applicant will be allowed to offer a rebuttal testimony. The decision to approve or deny an application or appeal may not legally be made upon personal views as to whether a project is a good project or not, nor may a decision be based on the number of citizens who support or who oppose a particular project. The law requires that all decisions must be made on the basis of whether the project meets the requirements of law, the comprehensive plan, and the land development regulations. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I think we actually have minutes on this agenda, don't we? No, we do not. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm having trouble loading my actual agenda. <laughs> sorry. Okay. okay. Witnesses swearing in. Okay, thank you. Is there been any ex parte communication? Mm, we, comment, uh, no, we're, we're not quite at the okay. items yet, so if you want to take any comments from the public related to non-agenda items at this time. So if there's anyone in the public that wishes to speak to any non-agenda items at this point, um, now's your opportunity. There's three minutes. Anyone at all? Okay, no, nothing present. Um, how about the uh, letters that came in after printing? Those are actually just, those are um, ex parte communications that you guys have received okay. relative to the items. So you would just note those during ex parte communications. So at this point, um, Ms. Buse would just go ahead and enter the file into the record. Good okay. evening. For A. Good evening, Jennifer Buse, Development Services Planner. Um, I'd like to enter record, a file into um, record, file number 2022-116, um, 2138 Southwest 12th Court, and the applicant is here to present. 
At this point, you could ask if there are any ex parte communications um, related to this item. Is, is anyone on the board here have any ex parte communications to speak about? I'm not. No. 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 Okay. So, uh, the city staff, go ahead. It'll be the applicant. It's the applicant. Okay. And our applicant today, please uh, state your name and uh, who you represent. Thank you. Hi, yes, uh, I'm Patrick Fitzgerald, I'm representing myself. Okay. You can go ahead and give your presentation. Oh, okay. Um, well, thank, thank you. you, Jennifer. Thank you, board. Um, it's going to be short and sweet, but uh, it's a variance for me and my lovely fiance. Uh, 2138 Southwest 12th Court. Um, the objective uh, for the variance is a request. We just want to enclose the carport. Um, we want to add square footage and a little value to the home, also increasing tax revenue for the city of Delray. Um, the enclosure would be basic, just two walls, two windows, and a door. Um, there is parking in the driveway. Currently, the status is two occupants, although we are trying for a baby and wanting more room. Uh, the property owners of, of us have been there for four years. Um, we've been residents of Delray since 2013. Uh, the blueprint is for the enclosure we have here. Um, this is the work we want done. Uh, the majority of the homes in the neighborhood already have the enclosed uh, carports. Um, these are the pictures of the uh, home currently and then with the, uh, the uh, cars parked in a tandem. So with that, we're just asking again for the variance for enclosure of the carport. Thank you. At this point, staff will go ahead and give their presentation as well. As stated, this is 2138 Southwest 12th Court. <clears throat> it is in an R1A zoning district. It is in Raybow Homes neighborhood. It is a ranch style home that was built in 1961. Um, the variance request is to allow parking in the front setback pursuant to the LDR of 4.6.9 C2. Single family detached homes are required to provide two parking spaces that shall not be in the front setback. So um, I just kind of screenshotted this here. As you can see here, um, this is the house. This is the carport that they're looking to um, add the addition or the enclosure on. This is um, the driveway. This is their front setback here. So one car is already at an existing nonconformity um, in the front setback. Um, here, I. This is Rainbow Homes, which um, was developed in um, 1961 with very sim similar models, either with a single car garage or a carport. Um, the applicant, um, if the applicant wasn't adding any living space, um, the carport would still have one required uh, parking space in the driveway, which is a, an existing nonconformity now. I tried to screenshot a little bit here. Um, as you can see, there are several cars that are this is um, a problem out here. It's problematic. I mean, because it is a, either a carport or a single car garage, everybody is in the same situation. You can see here, too, that people are parked in the um, swale or in the street. Um, this is the original plat. Uh, lot sizes for R1A are 60 by 100, and they are all provided at 70 by 92. Um, here again, I just wanted to show you that um, it's a required 25-foot setback. They are providing 20, 28.7. That's in the green here, and this is their carport. Again, here is their carport existing now, and this is the addition that they want to do in the existing carport. Um, alternatives to the variance, um, they could add a second floor addition or a rear, rear addition. These are the findings of um, analysis <clears throat> um, A through F. So um, the carport is built for a single car. If the applicant wasn't adding any living space, 
The, re the required parking is still problematic as it is an existing nonconformity. The addition of the carport into the living space um, will create a new nonconformity um, with the respect to the required parking as the two cars will be tandem now in, in the driveway, in the existing driveway. The actions um, are the direct result of the applicant as they are um, looking to do um, um, ad an addition. Um, similar variances have been granted um, throughout the city for this um, same type of thing um, when there is not a, enough uh, property in the front setback, et cetera. Um, there are no documented variances in Rainbow Homes. Um, however, there are several conversions of the garages and carports to living space um, that have created these nonconformities. As I said before, a second floor addition or a rear addition could be considered, and um, the overall appearance of the neighborhood and general purpose and intent of the existing regulations is not being affected. Um, as stated before, there are several conversions that have taken place through the years out in that neighborhood. And public notices were provided, and that concludes my presentation. Okay. At this point, if you want to um, call forward public comment related to this item. Okay. So we are calling for comment from the public. Now that you've heard the staff and the applicant's uh, proposal, do I have anyone in the audience that wishes to speak? Okay. So I guess we move up to our discussion. Yep. We need to first ask um, the applicant, do you guys have any rebuttal or cross-examination? No. Okay. And what about staff? I do not. Thank you. Okay. Now you can move into your board discussion. Okay. Have we had any, um, my board, let's, anybody have questions or? Yeah, I, I want to get this clarified because it's confusing now. We've had this similar situation before. But the condition has been typically a uh, requirement for two parking spaces, um, and and that would take a two-car garage in multiple places that had this condition because the setback was inadequate. Mm -hmm. Here, it looks to me like from what I've seen on the maps and uh, doing a Google drive-by, uh, not a real drive-by, everything seems to be only a one-car carport or a one-car garage or one of those converted to a room. So my question is. You're saying now that in 1761, I think it was a one-car requirement. Now the current development requirements are two, two parking spaces past the setback. I don't understand how it was, if the requirement in 61 was for one, now we could ask for two. I just, can you explain that? Well, you have to remember back in 1961, um, family lifestyle was much different. Um, most families only had one car at the time. So a one-car garage and a carport was and a one and a carport was sufficient at that time. The LDR was put into place after the build of this development. I, that, that's exactly my point. I don't see how you could apply a current requirement of the LDR that changes what was allowed under the rules in '61. That doesn't seem to be fair. I mean, or silly. Why? How could that be? And so we've had some of these issues come before you before, and um, we have been looking at doing an LDR text amendment, but until that goes through, the variances will come before you. It seems that's almost ex post facto to uh, impose a new law that didn't exist in 61 and say it now applies. That, that just doesn't seem to make sense. But I'll the, the city ordinances are ever changing. We're we're based on um, it's a constant process that yeah, but keeps I would moving. Think ex post facto is almost a common law situation. You can't do it. We have a form based code, and we are we are able to change our code as to move with the changing needs of this. I city. understand, but to apply it retroactively. Well, this is okay. This is coming in based on their application um, related to filling in their garage. I understand. I understand. Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, are the applicants permitted to have a Chattahoochee or gravel or some other drive 
on their side uh, sides, or would that be in the setback, the side yard setback? Yes, they can. Um, they do have to have at least three to five feet for drainage purposes. So um, I don't know if I have the. Oh, well, there was discussion. I think it might be in your packet. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have it up here that they are showing one that is proposed. You showed that in the report, and I thought there was a comment in the report that drainage was a, would be a problem if they wanted to do that. Is that not right? It could be a problem. Um, it needs to go through um, permitting. But if they did want to enclose their garage and they did put down gravel, would they then meet the more modern standards? It would be in the side side yard. It would be okay? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So... So if you could just clarify, the problem seems to be that if they enclose the carport, both carts are in the front setback? Yes. Would it be okay to have one car in the front setback like there, the rest of the neighborhood? There is one car in the front setback that is existing now. This would increase the, non, the existing nonconformity. Which we can't do. But if they parked on the side, it would be okay? We've had this explained before, as I understand it. Scott. You have to have the permanent parking spaces beyond the setback. But you don't have to park your car beyond the setback if you just park it in your driveway as long as you have the permanent parking space that is beyond the setback. That was okay. clearly explained in past cases. Is that not the interpretation? Sorry, can you, can you repeat your question? Okay. <laughs> it, it sounds very strange, but... The LDR says you must have two permanent parking spaces beyond the setback. That means it has to be a garage or a carport. It can't be a room because you can't park it in a room unless I don't know what. So what was told to us was you don't have to park your car beyond the setback as long as you have two permanent parking spaces in which you could park your car if you wanted to. And Agreeably, it sounds, but that was clearly explained by Bill in several other cases before, uh, and I think I'm not sure that even the owners understand parking in the driveway is not a violation. The violation is simply not having the permanent parking space beyond the setback, whether or not you choose to park your car. If you use it for storing your charcoal grill, that's fine. And then for you, maybe you can't park your car all the way in the carport. But parking the car in the driveway, per se, is not a violation. It's the building that's the violation, not the car. I'm, I'm not sure the exact way that it's enforced on the code enforcement side, but really what you guys are making the determination is whether this can be considered a parking spot that meets the requirements. Yeah, so it's got to be a permanent parking space. We understand that, yeah. Uh, Scott Poppy, principal, uh, well, development permit manager now. Um, uh, Mr. Cohen, you're exactly correct. Uh, there's no prohibition from uh, parking in your in your driveway. The the requirement is to have two parking spaces beyond the front setback. You are exactly correct. All right, thank you. Okay. Well, Poppy, sorry that. Poppy, can I? I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yeah, I just want to clarify with Ms. Fredericks, too. I do not want to say whether or not that that gravel parking can be approved. If they go to permitting and they do not have enough space, they're going to be right back here. Okay, so sorry, but I'm not sure I understood. So assuming that that paving can be permeable or some other solution that in a way avoids the need for a you know, planted area that will, will allow a car to go in there. That still is only one car, correct? What is the other one? The other one would be in the, in the front setback. It's in the front setback. It's an existing non-conformity. And that's considered, that goes for the existing one that covers that. So that's, that's that non, okay, so we don't have to be concerned with that. My question is really, I. What would I think the future in the near future we're gonna we're gonna 
the, the code has to be revised, in my opinion. This is something that everybody has a problem. I have the reverse problem. I have only one car. I get rid of the second one, and, and it's fine. But a lot, a lot of times this is happening. I see drives that the, the, the circular drives are always basically in the front set back. There's always a car there. You know, it's probably counters the other one. So, and I, I just have a friend in Boca, and he was like scratching his head because he said like, no, what are you talking about? I can park, as long as I'm parked behind my property line, within my lot, I can, I can, that's considered a parking space, you know? So I think we are a little antiquated because houses are, I mean, those things will probably come in place shortly. Staff does not disagree with you. All right, okay. Well, thank you for listening. To the so I have, a, I have a question. So the, the applicant has not applied to test whether he could park legally on the side of the house. Is that correct? I'm going to let the applicant answer that. I do know they have a permit in for the carport. Yes, we're just waiting for the approval so we can finish the carport, but we haven't applied for that. Okay, so is, is that the cart before the horse, though? I mean, if I don't think it can be approved if we don't have it. The way I read it, it can't be approved unless they have a parking spot, correct? Currently, you guys are, are looking at this to determine whether a variance is necessary to allow them to actually park the other car in the driveway. Um, if they, they need to get this variance before they can have a building permit approved um, to put that addition in. So it, that's the process that they've taken. They can come to ask for the variance so that they can do it in that way. Um, but it's subject to your approval, of course. I would be inclined to say they need to have these two permits in process. If, if we knew that the side parking was approved by the city for technical reasons, drainage reasons, or whatever, then my argument would be, well, then they have one permanent parking space that, to me, the property was originally approved for, and I would go along with it. But not knowing that they'll be able to get side parking, I'm going to quandary about what to do now. Sorry, I just want to make, oh, well, you can go ahead, John. So if they came in to get the, the permit for the pavers and it was approved, they wouldn't be here right now. They're choosing to come in to get a variance to do the tandem parking. The permit was disapproved for the carport because it was flagged for having the car in the front setback. To be clear, they do have one permanent parking spot. Which seems to me that they complied, the the build, when the builder was, when these places were built by the developer, however, in 1961, it seems to me they were in compliance with the rules that existed at that time, which I agree was based on the fact that people only had one car in many cases. But, but now, to apply the two space rule seems to me to be unfair. Mm -hmm. The, the two parking spot rule was already in place because they had the garage and they had the non-conforming spot in the setback. So now when they want to fill the garage in, that's when now they have to come for the variance to get a second spot. Uh, so they had two spots because of the garage and the non-conforming spot on the now, I think you're confusing the permanent parking space with the driveway. They're not the same thing. As long as you have one garage or one carport, as I understand what the rule was in 61, you're okay. But now you're saying, well, we're going to take away your one permanent parking space. You're going to have to add another one but you're still a problem because the current rule says you have to have two permanent place spaces, which still seems to be to be very unfair. A very, very tough interpretation of the new LDR applying to what the house looked like in 61. Sorry, I just want to make one more thing. So we're not taking away one of their permanent parking spots. Oh, really? There is a permanent parking spot. The garage, which was considered their second permanent parking spot. They don't spot. have a garage, they just have a carport. Carport, I'm right. sorry. The carport, which was considered their second spot, is well, now- was their first spot. Their There's only one permanent spot no, no. required. The driveway is not a permanent parking spot. It, it it's, is. <laughs> it's beyond the setback. It doesn't count for that, yeah. as Scott yeah. said. 
It's got nothing to do with the setback rule. Where you park your car doesn't matter with the setback. The building has to be beyond the setback, not the car. It's the car. And it's, it's the required spot in the car. <clears throat> okay. Um, the scenario uh, you, you were speaking of. Um, the, is there a, you were essentially saying, was there a prohibition from parking in your front yard, in, in, the, in the driveway? Yes. There is no prohibition against doing that, but you are required to provide two spaces um, outside of your front yard. Well, there's today, today you're required to have two. Correct. It seems to me in 61, there must have been a requirement for only one because this whole block is built that way. This, uh, whenever we, we modify our LDRs to have new regulations, they apply going back to when Delray became Delray. On um, the street, every house that has only one permanent parking space, is, whether they've ever touched it or not since they bought it, is automatically in violation of something. Right. The, 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 the notion that, you know, to, you know, mm. freeze a, the development regulations for a, any particular piece of property in time is, is impossible. It, it, it would be a administrative impossibility to say, okay, for this, this property, the development regulations that were in effect at the time that your property was developed is goes forward to the end of time that that it's, it's it'd be an uh, administrative nightmare to try to figure that one out i agree but let me just offer a comment about the other side of the coin if you have a house or any kind of a building and it burns to the ground today but it was built in 1961 according to the building code you can put it back to the code restrictions that applied in 1961 when you, if you rebuild it exactly to the original drawings, you're in compliance. But your Turk and the LDR is going the other way. It's saying, no, we, when we update, we, everything is retroactively applied, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Mr. Cohen, it, it's not retroactively applied. There's an existing nonconformity on the property. Mm -hmm. They cannot expand that existing nonconformity to make it so that they have two permanent spots in the set pack yeah, I just, without I, when they're yeah, going for another saying, permit. But it's not clear to me that you can point to today's LDR and say that that proves it was existing nonconformity in 1961. But I would like to see there must be a record of what the law said with this regard in 1961 someplace. What I'm the saying. The LDR, has, you know, it's been modified over the years, but don't you keep the old copies? Can't we find out what the LDR actually said with respect to this requirement in 1961? Sir, um, when, when I say existing nonconformity, I mean that that's been allowed because it existed prior to the ordinance being put in place. That's even so, worse. Now you're saying we're taking a requirement that didn't even exist in 1961 and we were expecting you to comply with it no that's not what i'm saying well, that's not what i'm saying at all the requirement existed is what you said before the ldr existed yes what does that even mean can if you just give me a moment i, I understand it's so confusing. an existing nonconformity means that it is allowed because it existed prior to the the passing of the ordinance so that one one permanent spot is allowed because it existed prior to the passing of the ordinance now that they come here for a permit for closing in the garage, that makes it so that they cannot expand the existing nonconformity, allowing that one car in the setback to make it two cars in the setback. Yeah, I, I, hear, I would say the existing situation is an existing condition. I would not say it's an existing nonconformity and, and that, because there, that's wasn't, just, there wasn't a rule with respect to this in 1961, perhaps. And that's just the language we use to say that that exists now and it doesn't comply with the current ordinances, but it's not to say that that is so. cited or there's no code enforcement because of an existing nonconformity. An existing nonconformity is just saying that exists, but it no longer meets our code, but we're leaving it the way it is. So, I have one more question. Is it, so, 
diverging from this discussion, but um, as a realtor, I look at a lot of houses around Delray, and it appears to me that quite a lot of people have converted their carports into additional living space with or without permits. So these folks appear to be trying to do the right thing, which kudos to you. And it appears to me that maybe on the same block, I have not driven down and looked at your house, but I drive all over Delray all the time. Maybe four or five neighbors have uh, an additional bedroom that they just, at some point, maybe in 1962, I don't know when, but at some point they convert into living space and nobody has a problem with that. And it can be sold and you don't really look at that. So um, it's hard to know how to be fair when people are following the correct procedure and it appears that they may be penalized for it. And, and every, every property is taken case by case. So some, some may have parking that exists within the setback that are not within the setback that they could put parking and close in their garage. And the only way to be fair is to actually apply the standards that exist on your variance form. So if you go through and you determine that they meet those conditions, then you can grant the variance and allow them to move forward with their project. If you don't think that they meet the conditions, then you don't grant the variance and they find a, another way to move forward with their project. I, I put the conditions up for you guys to take a look at again. Um, a says that special conditions and circumstances exist which are peculiar to the land, structure, or building, that little or, literal or, sorry, I can't say the word, interpretation of the regulations would deprive the application of rights commonly enjoyed by other properties subject to the same zoning, that special conditions and circumstances have not resulted from the actions of the applicant, that granting the variance would not confer the applicant any special privilege, that the reason set forth um, of the variance petition justifies the granting of the variance and the variance is the minimum variance that will make possible and that the granting of the variance will be in harmony with the general purpose of the neighborhood. May I ask the applicant a question? Yes. So you currently have one parking spot uh, behind the setback and I'm looking at the survey or the proposed site plan T-1. It appears that you're going to add pavers. We're going to have the same one car behind the setback. So essentially, you're enclosing in the covered space, but you're going to still have the same result. Is that correct? Um, I'm not sure about the question. I can say that when we were applying for the permit, I think what kind of stirred everything up was they were saying, do you have a space for the construction truck? And we thought, well, yeah, sure, they could park on the side of the driveway um, and then and then it came up that they asked can you put pavers down and we said sure sure we can put pavers we'll do whatever down you want that's what so needed. if you would have those pavers you essentially have a, a parking spot for one car behind the setback it, but um, if we did the pavers we wouldn't be here <laughs> we're just following the rules <laughs> right but what I'm getting at is when you perform this construction you get your permit you're gonna have you're gonna be where you started you'll still have the one spot so you're not asking for two spots that are in the setback. You're really asking for one. Right. Yes. yes. You know, um, before when I spoke, there is another permit pending, but you do not have a permit for the second parking spot yet, correct? No, because we're, we want the variance to actually be for tandem parking. One would be in the existing non-conformity and the other would be the variance for the setback for the one parking of the second car well my my thoughts maybe i'm not understanding but it's possible they might not get a okay for a second spot on the side of the house is that what that, that's what you guys are are deciding right now whether they're allowed to have the variance to park to have that second spot that that's the complete it's nothing about distance from setback or 
property lines for the side that uh, make me understand what it takes to get a side parking spot I think you need to take the equation of the side parking spot out of out of the variance that is before you tonight I think I think it's going to come down when the building department looks at it I think drainage is going to be the issue but if it's a permeable parking area pavers as opposed to concrete uh, it's likely to go because it's considered not affecting the drainage that's a guess because um, mm -hmm. we have class one soil every place I know of in Delray Beach and drainage is really not a problem in general as long as you don't block it with uh, solid material but again that's up to the building department so I think if we grant it uh, you know may be into something else when they try to get the paving permit that's another problem I'm still trying to understand the word the wording what we're supposed to approve for example is the variance to allow parking in the front setback mm -hmm. yes okay uh, there's no discussion of the second spot just one spot basically so that means that you kind of grandfather the fact that this property can have only one spot, one garage? That's what one I spot, I mean. There's an existing nonconformity. Hmm? One spot is already grandfathered, yes. yes. And then the second spot is the one that you guys are talking oh. about to allow the parking in the front set back to give them that second. It's the same spot. Like what, two, two things are the same. Tandem, one in front of the other. Yes. You well, yeah, the no, there's no tandem space. You, they you, want to be able to stack the cars in the driveway. Oh, how? Legally. From the from the yeah, new room I'm, outside. I'm going there. Thirty whatever it is. I mean, you need thirty six. It'll be feet. clear for the board if we could pull up the sheet, um, the proposed site plan. That's how we're proposing that we park. And then you'll. I think the board will see that they will still have one part, one car parked behind the setback. No, no, that's not the issue. It's just you only have twenty eight feet. To, you can't have tandem into 28 feet. Parking in the driveway is not the problem. You can no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that, but they, the they, no, the, the problem is that all they... All the way up to the street. There's no setback on where you park the car. It's where the permanent parking space is inside the building beyond the setback. It's still, it's still confusing to many That's people. That's being taken away. Mm -hmm. Well, no, if they, if they enclose the carport, and they get approval for side parking on a paved area, they would be back to where they were in 1961 with one permanent parking space that was the acceptable condition then. It would, to me, stay the acceptable condition today right. because it m doesn't degrade the parking situation from what it was in 1961. That was my, that was my, uh, my outlook on it. All right. I'm just... Just had a little problem with the language. I don't think. I don't think we're doing what we. So the what we've, uh, picture, we've, in uh, let's see, it's attachment three. Twelfth court two proposed site plan. Yeah. In the middle of the site plan, does show pavers and proposed open parking. Yeah, but that's not what we're talking. <clears throat> but they don't have the permit for that yet. Right. So and they're not asking even to, to they, they accept. I have to go for a permit for that paving, pay a paving permit. At this end. point, the only thing you guys are deciding is whether they meet the standards for the variance to allow parking within the setback. To allow their permanent parking spot to be considered in this par in the setback. Um, let me have one other question to the city. The, what is the width of a that's necessary for a parking permit? I, I can't answer that. That goes through city engineering. Okay. So each property is, it must be a standard 12 foot, 11 foot or something? A typical stall is 10 six. 9 by 18. I think a typical parking stall is 10 six. No, it's actually not. I don't think there are any requirements for residential. It doesn't matter. Size, they just need to meet the three to five feet for drainage on the side setback or right. wherever it's being setback parked. Wouldn't, side setback wouldn't apply to pavers, I don't think, does it? Well, you don't have to go all the way to the fence. Yeah. Well, pavers right up to the property line? No, you cannot have pavers up to the property line. What's the distance from the property line where, where pavers are allowed, assuming they're permeable? It's three to five feet. They have 12 feet. They have 12 feet. 
At this time, what were you approving or disapproving? Well, it's just a very interesting uh, discussion we're having here. Um, sometimes, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm concerned again that this past year with these new LDRs, we twice have asked clients to come back because I don't feel comfortable increasing the nonconformity here. Uh, if I knew the parking was going to be granted, I, I think it's um, pretty well given that not only will you get your parking, but so will everybody else in that neighborhood. And I don't know if that's what we want to promote. I know that all stands separate. That's my opinion. Everything is done on a case-by-case -case basis. So you're, you're deciding whether it meets the requirements of the variance and only this property. Every property is different, and some might not, some, even their neighbor might be different than theirs. Um, so you're never setting precedent when you make a decision. Um, these decisions act on their own because land is very unique. So um, you guys making a decision here today doesn't affect any other properties that would come before you. Is there any more discussion or questions? Um, Do you like me to go into like reading to, the board yeah. order? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is file number 2022-116, property owner Patrick Fitzgerald, address 2138 Southwest 12th Court, request consideration to allow a car to be parked in the front setback. Pursuant to land development regulations, section 2.4.7A5, following consideration of all the evidence and testimony, the Board of Adjustment for the City of Delray Beach finds as follows. One, that special conditions and circumstances exist which are peculiar to the land structure or building involved and which are not generally applicable to other lands, structures, or buildings subject to the same zoning. Diane, could you please call the roll? Vlad Dumitrescu? Yes. Scott Clark? I'm here. Or yes? Yes. Alec Hayes? Yes. Carol Fredericks? Yes. Robert Cohen? Yes. Garland Williams? No. Okay, so that was five to one. Um, that literal interpretation of the regulations would deprive the applicant of rights commonly enjoyed by other properties subject to the same zoning. Diane, could you please call the roll? Vlad Dumitrescu? Yes. Scott Clark? Yes. Alec Hayes? Yes. Carol Fredericks? Yes. Robert Cohen? Yes. Marlon Williams? No. It's also a five to one. Um, number three, that the special conditions and circumstances have not resulted from actions of the applicant. Diane, could you? Trescu? No. Scott Clark? Yes. Alec Hayes? Yes. Carol Fredericks? Yes. Robert Cohen? Yes. Garland Williams? No. The four to two. That granting the variance will not confer onto the applicant any special privilege that is denied to other lands, structures, and building under the same zoning. Vlad Dumitrescu? Yes. Scott Clark? Yes. Alec Hayes? Yes. Carol Fredericks? Yes. Robert Cohen? Yes. Garland Williams? No. It's a five to one. That the reasons set forth in the variance petition justify granting of the variance and that the variance is the minimum variance that will make possible the reasonable use of the land, building, or structure. Vlad Dumitrescu? Yes. Scott Clark? Yes. Alec Hayes? Yes. Carol Fredericks? Yes. Robert Cohen? Yes. Garland Williams? No. Back to one. That the granting of the variance will be in harmony with the general purpose and intent of existing regulations will not be injurious to the neighborhood or otherwise detrimental to the public welfare. Vlad Dumitrescu? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Scott Clark? Yes. Alec Hayes? Yes. Carol Fredericks? Yes. Robert Cohen? Yes. Arlen Williams? No. 
eight, and that was also a five to one. Um, because number three, that special conditions and circumstances have not resulted from actions of the applicant resulted in a four two where you did not have a super majority. Um, it is required of the board to make a motion that would disapprove um, the variance in this matter. So if somebody could make a motion to deny the approval of the variance. So moved. Need a motion? Second. 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 There was a motion, I'm sorry. Vlander well, the, the motion is to deny the variance, um, which is actually required of you guys because of the vote of the 4-2, which did not get a supermajority on number three. So was the motion made or is it? We, yes, it was. The, somebody has to second. I'm oh, sorry, that's what I asked. Yes. Okay, I second. She made the motion. She seconded. I seconded. Vlad <laughs> Dumitrescu? Yes. Scott Clark? Yes. Alec Hayes? Yes. Carol Fredericks? With regret, yes. Robert Cohen? No. Marilyn Williams? Yes. Mr. Cohen, unfortunately, you, you guys actually um, yeah. came to a decision where there was not a supermajority on number three, so, so you're actually required to, to vote yes to this. Right, okay, I understand. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> well, the motion is finalized, and um, any other comments on this one? We can okay. go ahead to the next one. So we'll go to the next one. Staff, please enter the next report, which is agenda item. I'd like to put into um, record file number 2022-070. And this is um, for 335 Southeast 7th Avenue, and the applicant is here. Okay, one, oh. one second. Okay, the applicant is here. Yes, good evening. For the record, Christina Belenke, Jenny Miss School and Backman. My address is 14 Southeast 4th Street in Boca Raton, Florida. And I am here this evening uh, regarding the boat lift variance request for 335 Southeast 7th Avenue. Um, it's about a 0 0.24 acre property zoned R1AA. It's developed with a single family home that is the residence of Jeffrey and Lynn Nestor. And Mr. Nestor is with me here this evening. So the specific variance request is a variance from section uh, 7.9.11a of the city's land development regulations to allow a boat lift to extend 29 feet into the intracoastal waterway uh, where only 20 feet is permitted. So this is to show you the existing conditions uh, related to the intracoastal waterway and the improvements. There's currently an L-shaped dock that was approved and permitted in 2004 um, and it includes a 5 by 10 foot dock, a 5 foot by 25 foot access ramp, and two dolphin piers. Um, so the existing dock actually extends a little over 29 feet uh, into the intercoastal waterway as measured from the rubble rock wall um, today. And so I've highlighted on the screen the portion of the dock that is proposed to be removed um, and replaced with the boat lift. The proposed boat lift would be added to the existing dock uh, that extends 29 feet into the waterway um, and it'll be also, the boat lift would also be 29 feet when raised um, in, in the position. And so the, essentially the boat lift that's proposed would extend no farther into the intracoastal waterway than uh, what exists today with the dock. And so the reason for the variance request is largely, essentially mostly based on the existing water conditions. 
And so we have uh, secured a hydrographic survey of the area um, of the waterway by the dock. And you can see the image, uh, which is a photograph uh, from my client's property that shows essentially the low water line um, you know, from the rubble rock wall. So pursuant to the hydrographic survey, um, the mean low water is actually at 0 0.013 feet from the riprap roll. And the mean low water at the proposed boat lift is only 2.0. And those are highlighted on there for you. So therefore, if the boat lift was placed any closer to the property line, um, it would my client would not be able to safely navigate his boat um, due to the low depths of the water. And so in terms of the variance criteria, um, criteria A is that special conditions and circumstances exist which are peculiar, peculiar to the land, excuse me, structure or building involved and which are not generally applicable to other land structures or building in the same zoning district. So again, uh, in terms of this criteria, I point you to the hydrographic survey that was provided that does show the mean low water at 0 0.013 feet from the riprap wall and the mean low water at the proposed boat lift of only 2.0. Uh, criteria B is literal, literal interpretation, I can't say that word either, Jennifer, <laughs> uh, of the regulations would deprive the applicant of rights commonly enjoyed by other properties in the same zoning district. And so again, property owners within the R1AA zoning district and along the intercoastal waterway commonly enjoy the right to have a boat docked at their property. In this instance, the mean low water levels remain low 34 feet into the intercoastal waterway, which makes it incredibly difficult to safely navigate and dock, and dock a boat in this area. The special conditions and circumstances have not resulted from the, ap from the actions of the applicant. And so these property owners are clearly not responsible for the mean low water levels adjacent to their property. Um, further, the property owners purchased the property in 2015, long after the existing dock and access ways were permitted and constructed. Criteria D, granting the variance, will not confer onto the applicant um, any special privilege that is denied to others, uh, land structures and buildings under the same zoning district. And Florida statutes provide the right of ingress, egress, and boating for, land, for lands bound by navigable waters, extending to the ordinary high water mark of the waterway. Um, further, the property owner uh, currently has a dock and access ramp that does extend more than 29 feet into the waterway, adjacent to a, which a boat would normally sit. Um, so the applicant is proposing to extend no further into the waterway than these existing structures. Criteria E, the reasons set forth in the variance um, justify granting the variance and the variance is the minimum necessary. So again, the hydrographic survey demonstrates the mean low water lines adjacent to the property and the necessity for the boat lift to extend more than 20 feet into the waterway. It shows that the mean water level, again, 13 feet from the wrap wall is 0, 0.0. And at the boat lift, it's only 2.0. Again, the existing dock to which the boat would otherwise be moored extends more than 29 feet into the intercoastal waterway. To more safely secure the boat, uh, the applicant is proposing to remove a portion of the dock and replace it with the boat lift that would extend no further into the waterway than the existing structures. And finally, the granting of the variance will be in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the existing regulations and will not be injurious to the neighborhood or otherwise detrimental to the welfare of the public. And the variance is in harmony with the general purpose and intent, uh, which is to allow safe ingress, egress, and docking of boats within the waterway. Further, the variance will not be injurious as the proposed boat lift would extend no farther into the waterway than the existing dock structures, thus having no greater impact to neighboring properties or those navigating the waterway. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have.
Mm -hmm. Any questions? Be before we actually go to staff's um, presentation, could we just make sure about ex parte communications? Yeah. Has anyone on the board had any ex parte no. communications? No. 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 Yes, I have. Um, my company is actually using their law firm on multiple projects, but I was not aware Christina would be here today. So. Hi, Scott. Okay, um, this is 335 Southeast 7th Avenue. Um, it is single family in, R in the R1AA, and um, it is adjoining adjacent zoning districts are R1AA, and the intercoastal is to the east. Um, the proposal is to remove a portion of the existing dock running parallel to the property and add a boat lift to the existing dock that extends 29 feet into the waterway in the raised um, position. Pursuant to the LDR section 7.9.11A standards for approval, the boat lift in a raised position shall not extend any more than 20 feet into the waterway from the property line or seawall or bulk, bulkhead, whichever is nearer to the water. Um, these are the existing conditions. Um, this is just a survey which shows you the existing dock. Um, this is actually the um, dolphin in the wood dock here. And again, this is the hy hy hydrographic survey, and I as well circled um, the mean low t um, water where it's at zero, and again, where the boat lift is going to um, be, is, is proposed, um, is at two. Um, here again is the proposed boat lift, and it shows you the 29 feet. <coughs> And again, this is the extension. Um, this is a little bit different. This does not have a seawall. It has um, what you call a riprap or a rubble, rubble wall. And it extends 13 feet. And here is the boat lift that's going to extend 16 feet 6 inches. Or I'm sorry, the um, dolphin. And then the boat lift here, which will extend 12 feet 6 inches, which will be the 29 feet. Um, again, um, here is the riparian rights. Um, this is the Florida State statue that Ms. Belinke um, mentioned, and this is for rights for ingress, egress, boating, bathing, and fishing. And here is your analysis. And um, the proposed boat lift at mean low water is at two feet, and this can make it difficult to navigate boat. Um, a, uh, that should say a boat safely in the depths of the water. Um, if the boat lift were to be placed any closer to the property line, the hydro hydrographic survey demonstrates that the waters are shallow at mean low tide. Um, the actions are not the direct result of the applicant. The homeowner is proposing to repair the dolphin, remove the dock, and add the boat lift. Um, the original dolphin did extend 25 feet into the waterway from the rip wrap with a five foot dock, so they're actually reducing it by one foot. Um, this is not a special privilege, or a special privilege but not confer on to the applicant as there have been simil similar variances granted and there have been some denied. It depends on how much waterway um, there is in the nav nav navigable channel um, at that time. The variance is the minimal um, as the repairs are being made, and as I stated, um, it is one foot less. Um, and the variance request for the construction of the boat lift will not disrupt the general function of the neighborhood. Um, there are many existing dolphins and docks and boat lifts um, uh, along this section of the water. Public notices were provided, and I believe that concludes my presentation. Okay, is there any public comment at this time? Okay, is there any rebuttal or cross-examination from the staff? No, there is not. Not from my end either. Okay, any rebuttal from the applicant? No, thank you. Okay, and uh, any cross from the applicant? No, okay, and uh, a time for board discussion, please. Looking at the uh, city report and also other uh, Google Maps, um, there are several boats in this area, and they all tie up on the 
intercoastal waterway side of the dock uh, so that the uh, impediment to navigation is not just the dock itself, but the dock plus the boat tied up next to it. My question is, when the applicant decides to put in the boat lift, are they still going to normally tie the boat up and simply moor it on the end of the dock, uh, as, would they, as they would do now with the finger pier? Or is it always going to be on the boat lift when they decide to not use it? My understanding is that it will always be on the boat lift, essentially, because uh, that portion of the dock where you see on the graphics, the aerials, um, that essentially runs parallel to the property lines where docks are normally boats, that's going to be removed, so they won't have that option. Um, so it would need to be perpendicular uh, to the property line. Um, and obviously the safest place to, place to do so is in the boat lift. I understand. And the reason I ask that is because with the, the boat in the boat lift, as opposed to being tied up on the eastern end of the dock, the whole combination of boat and boat lift protrudes significantly less into the waterway than it does with the boat moored to the end of the dock. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> okay. Can I... Can I ask next question? Um, I'm trying to understand exact how how this legally works. Is this part of their property? They actually own the right to use this, or how is? In some cases, you have to have riparian rights or other things. I mean, when you go in the intercoast, I can see that everybody has a dock, but if you also look at the property line and the survey, it doesn't go into the water. It actually, stops way before that, and they right. purchase. But what do they purchase actually? Right, so the, the fee simple ownership is the property that's outlined in red essentially, but there are riparian rights uh, by Florida statutes that extend essentially to the, I, I believe, the high, highest water level, and um, I can probably pull up the exact language, uh, but those rights do extend into the intercoastal waterway. And they're not leasing or not the per, the permanent. They actually part of their property. The whatever piece of land that the the riparian rights yes extend alongside those properties that are adjacent to navig navigable ugh, navigable waters. <laughs> um, so the the rights do go. They do tie to the property. So so the city del Rey had the regulation that they allows them to decide if it's 25 feet or 30 feet or 29 feet or all that. It's perfectly legal. The reason I'm asking because I'm involved in the project, I'm an architect, and, and we, we are building, proposing a dock in a building, happens to be in Riviera Beach, and it was actually controlled by a lot of factors. We couldn't do anything we want. I mean, it's, yes, they, there is a property the portion that they have a control over it, but it's only a lease. And being a lease, you have to renew it every 10 years or something like that. And it's, it's also uh, a um, limited how much you can build or the dock and square footage based on whatever criteria. So I understand that none of that is applicable here and the Ray has complete control over this. There's no Army Corp of Engineer. There's nobody else that has any jurisdiction over this. I wouldn't say the, the city has complete control over their property, but the city does have the ability to regulate property, Just, and the city has the ability to regulate within the riparian rights as well. Mm -hmm. um, just okay. like any ordinance you would see regulating their house and where they can build their garage to, you can put regulations related to the areas within the riparian rights. Um, and to, to just offer a point of clarification, the Army Corps of Engineers also does have um, permitting authority as well. So we are uh, within that process and are hope, hoping to get permits within the next month or so. Um, but that is required for this okay. property as well. Okay. No, that helps me understand because it's different than what I've learned so far. Okay. And I, if I have to say something, I do think in a way this is going to improve the situation as long as they're not extending any further. The, the lift most of likely is going to be lower than the current dock and it will kind of visually be even less of, of a penetration in the water per se, in my opinion. Thank you. Any other comments, questions, discussion? <coughs> So <clears throat> we're ready to uh, put a uh, okay. load up.
All right, everybody's ready for the board order? Okay. Um, file number 2022-070, property owner Jeffrey and Lynn Nestor. Address 335 Southeast 7th Avenue. Request consideration to allow a boat lift in the raised position to extend more than 20 feet into the waterway from the property line, seawall, or bulkhead, whichever is closest to the waterway. Pursuant to land development regulations, section 2.4.7A5, following consideration of all the evidence and testimony, the Board of Adjustment for the City of Delray Beach finds as follows. One, that special conditions and circumstances exist which are peculiar to the land, structure, or building involved and which are not generally applicable to other lands, structures, or buildings subject to the same zoning. Glad to Matrescu? Yes. Scott Clark? Yes. Mark Hayes? Yes. Carol Fredericks? Yes. Robert Cohen? Yes. Harlan Williams? Yes. Okay, six to zero. Um, two, that literal interpretation of the regulations would deprive the applicant of rights commonly enjoyed by other properties subject to the same zoning. Glad to Matrescu? Yes. Scott Clark? Yes. Alec Hayes? Yes. Carol Fredericks? Yes. Robert Cohen? Yes. Harlan Williams? Yes. Okay, six to zero. That the special conditions and circumstances have not resulted from actions of the applicant. Glad to Matrescu? No. Scott Clark? Yes. Alec Hayes? Yes. Carol Fredericks? Yes. Robert Cohen? Yes. Carlin Williams? Yes. Five to one. That granting the variance will not confer onto the applicant any special privilege that is denied to other lands, structures, and buildings under the same zoning. Vlad Dumitrescu? Yes. Scott Clark? Yes. Alec Hayes? Yes. Carol Fredericks? Yes. Robert Cohen? Yes. Garland Williams? Yes. Six to zero. Number five, that the reasons set forth in the variance petition justify granting of the variance and that the variance is the minimum variance that will make possible the reasonable use of the land, building, or structure. Glad to rescue? Yes. Scott Clark? Yes. Alec Hayes? Yes. Carol Fredericks? Yes. Robert Cohen? Yes. Carlin Williams? Yes. Six to zero. Um, number six, that the granting of the variance will be in harmony with the general purpose and intent of existing regulations, will not be injurious to the neighborhood or otherwise detrimental to the public welfare. Vlad Dumitrescu? Yes. Scott Clark? Yes. Alec Hayes? Yes. Carol Fredericks? Yes. Robert Cohen? Yes. Carlin Williams? Yes. Okay, also a six to zero. Um, through all of these six findings, you guys have made positive findings with a super majority voting in favor that the conditions exist. Um, so at this point, you would need a motion to approve the variance request. I move approval of the variance request for 335 Southeast 7th Avenue 2022-070 from LDR section 7.9 to allow a boat lift to extend nine feet beyond the 20 foot maximum distance permitted into the waterway. Second. Glad to Matrescu? Yes. Scott Clark? Yes. Alec Hayes? Yes. Carol Fredericks? Yes. Robert Cohen? Yes. Harlan Williams? Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, the um, ordinance, the uh, request is approved. Thank you. Our next item is 1221 Lang Street. A variance and request to consider the encroachment of a pool into a side street setback, allowable by code. Okay, our hey. presenter. Max Weinberg, applicant. I'm sorry, oh, we do need to allow staff to enter the file into the record yes. first, and then go ahead. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. 
Good evening, board members. Uh, Julian Gadanik, Senior Planner. Uh, before yet, this time is file 2022-072. It's a variance for 1221 Lang Street, and I'll turn it over to the applicant. And I apologize again, Mr. Weinberg, but if we could do ex parte communications before we get to okay. the presentation. You just want to explain that into the yes. record? Yes, I used to work for Mr. Iliopoulos, and I am familiar with this project, so I would like to recuse myself. No ex parte. No. No ex parte. No. 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 Yes. Okay. Thank you. And, and at this point, uh, Mr. Weinberg, since there are only five members on the board at this point with the conflict, we just want to give you the opportunity. Um, you do have to have a super majority, so that is five for this board. Um, so we do like to extend the courtesy to allow you to make the decision if you want to proceed with the five or try to come back at a time where there's a, a greater amount of members on the board. I'll confer with Gary Iliopoulos. We've decided to proceed. So I'm Max Weinberg, 2001 Northeast 6th Avenue. I am the applicant. I want to say good evening to the members of the Board of Adjustment. Uh, and before I turn the presentation over to Gary, I'd just like to thank you all for the time you've spent examining this new request and for the significant accommodations you've already provided to my wife Becky and I last April for this project, uh, those being variances that were necessary to begin to improve this very odd-sized parcel for the R1 AAA zone. As most of you know, I'm a member of the Planning and Zoning Board, and I've participated in my share of meetings that have gone long into the night, so I'll be very, very brief. It seems to me that a perfectly appropriate question from the Board tonight might be, why didn't we include the pool when the initial application was heard by the Board of Adjustment last year? The one very simple answer is I messed up. That's right. I thought that despite the fact that most homes in Florida have pools, well, I don't swim that much and my wife Becky doesn't swim at all. So no pool was contemplated at that time, and this decision I learned was a big mistake. I was informed of this oversight by our two adult children <laughs> and their spouses this past Thanksgiving, who when we showed them the approved plans from last April, they said nearly in unison, by the way, wait, what? You're not putting even a small splash pool in your backyard? What about when we come to visit you? What about when we come to visit you with our grandchildren? You live in Florida. Immediately I realized I had a situation on my hands and they had a good point. So I had to do something. And as usual, Gary Eliopoulos came up with, illustrated to us, and we hope will to you as well tonight, an elegant design solution that would make sense within the overall context of the project. So tonight, literally, with my hat in my hand, and fingers crossed, we hope you'll approve this proposed component of our house. And if you do, I will then be able to move into our new updated home from where I currently reside, which is the doghouse. Thank you, and with that, I give you the very talented architect of the works, Gary Eliopoulos. Good evening. Uh, for the record, my name is Gary Eliopoulos. I'm with GE Architecture. Our address is 1045 East Atlantic Avenue. Thank you, Max, for that introduction. Um, let me just see here. Do I think, is this what I'm using? Yeah. I'll try one way and see how that works. Well, maybe I'll try another way. Okay, um, 
For some of the board members that might not have seen this last April, I will touch upon some of the items that are a little unique to this property. Uh, we are on the east side of Delray, um, basically along A1A and uh, Andrews is Lang Street. It's a unique part of town, and the fact is that Lang Street is actually a one-way street. Uh, there is a low volume of uh, density, if you will, with houses on this street. Uh, therefore, it is one way. Uh, right now, you'll see there's the house. It is right alongside Sandpiper, and Lang is the one that actually is one way that runs east to west. So this was the previously approved site plan. Um, as Max indicated, we did not have uh, a swim pool in this. Uh, one of the things that we are going to talk about, and Max touched upon it, is our zoning. Our zoning is R1 AAA. Um, the fact is that this is a very small lot. Uh, I'm going to highlight, this is our proposed site plan, and here's where you're going to be seeing where we are calling, uh, as Max stated, a, a splash pool. I mean, it, it defines as a pool, but it's actually more like a kiddie pool. Uh, Here's where you are seeing our courtyard. So this basically is an existing six foot high wall that goes around this area. I think one of the things you think about a pool is gonna be the activities and the reason why we are coming to this board is the fact that once again, not only is the lot small, but the fact is it's unique and we aren't gonna have a large deck around this pool and it's not gonna be a large pool. Therefore, the impact on abutting neighbors would be minimal, if anything. Um, staff talks about it and we too have some dimensions on our drawings which we're talking about. We are pushing the pool up against an existing wall. Um, the pool is literally five feet wide. Now when you look at the total distance we're basically from the property line we're approximately 15 foot 10 feet or 10 inches off of our building. So there is also a little bit of a structural issue when you're doing a pool you like to stay away from the existing foundations this way keeping it more stable. The other part is this is circulation that you're walking through and you have a little seating area. Um, again, this is uh, an aerial that we're looking at. Uh, one of the things that it talks about in the code, and this is not part of this, but it does talk about how pools can get a reduction in side setbacks uh, to five feet, but it's more designed for when you're on a golf course, intercoastal. Now we are not there, but it does talk about when something is 50 feet or more open. So the house to the west of us is a little over 50 feet, 50 feet, 7 inches. We happen to be working on that house right now. Um, it, I believe there is emails where this uh, particular client of ours, the Mariani's, have supported this uh, variance. Uh, their house is also, and one of the things that we could talk about is, I mean, Max's house is a 1938. Uh, we do believe it was designed by one of the prominent architects of the era. We think it could have been Sam Ogren because the house right to the west of it that we're renovating is a Sam Ogren house built two years before and has all the same details going throughout the project. Um, as you see, this is, again, if you've driven this area, there's Lang Street, uh, a, a very charming part of Delray. This is old Delray, if you ever would see it. Um, this is Sandpiper. One of the unique things about Sandpiper now, so we're going to be seeing this wall, and actually staff has talked about how the existing house is actually approximately a foot off of the property line. There's only four houses on this street. Max would be the fifth one, but basically you're talking a low volume of traffic on this street. Um, as we start going through, there's an aerial. So now what's happening is, in our proposed design, along what I'm going to call the lower left-hand side where the house stops and it looks like there's some shelving there. That's where we're proposing a two-car garage. The courtyard is right there. So you are going to see that the courtyard is totally enclosed. Uh, it's heavily vegetated. So the fact is I, I don't believe we're going to be having anything that would ever be bothering any of the nearby neighbors. Uh, I believe the neighbor to the north were more than uh, 37 feet from that property line and we're going to have the garage that's going to be blocking it so that any noise generated from this small area would not be anything that would offend anybody. So here's where we have uh, the code. We're talking about we are requesting a variance from section 4.6.15 G1 yard encroachment swimming pools, the top of which are no higher than grade level, may extend into the rear, interior, or street side setback areas by but no closer than 10 feet to any property line except as provided in subsection 2 and 4 below. Swimming pools shall not extend into a front setback area noted in section 4.3.4k. 
Uh, so there's the portion that we are asking for relief. Um, one of the things that we wanted to highlight again is I want you to understand the size of this property. So in R1 AAA, the minimum lot size is 12,500 square feet. Okay, we are 53 plus 100 square feet. So you're talking about a very small property. I want you to think about the minimum zoning requirements in Delray, which is R1A. Minimum lot size for that is 7,500 square feet. We're below that by 2,000 square feet. So we are talking about a very small, unique piece of property. Uh, here was that part that I was talking about uh, when it's abutting against a wide open area. It basically talks about when adjacent to at least 50 feet of open space, as defined in section 4.3.45H, C and D, swim pools at grade level may extend into the rear or interior side setback areas, but no closer than five feet. I'm only pointing that out for the fact is that staff and or the city, the LDRs understand when you're near an open area, you're going to be less impacting to a neighbor. And therefore, it's not as bad as when you do have a large pool, pool deck, and you're right up next to somebody within 10 feet. Uh, here's a little rendition of what we're talking about. Um, we have a little profile there. So this is actually looking from the north towards the south of the pool. Again, this pool is five feet wide. Uh, it does have a length of 17 and then it has a five foot by five foot little spa area. You're seeing that we do have a little paver area there. One of the things that staff does point out is that we are not reducing our pervious and impervious area. We are actually maintaining everything with this pool for the fact is where the pool is is all pavers right now. Here's another view. Now we are looking towards the north. Again, when you see this, we do have that six foot high existing wall going all the way around. Once again, screening it from the public right of way and buffering it from any of the neighbors. Again, another view looking from the home. This is actually the existing wall on the north side. You can see where we're proposing the garage. Uh, the door is actually in approximately the same location that the existing door is right now. So again, this is all enclosed. And that's what you'd be seeing from the street. Okay, so I'm going to have to read from my book here because I know I can't see that well. Okay, so basically, this is actually I'm taking from staff's report, but it is the, the criteria that you will be looking at tonight. That special conditions and circumstances exist which are peculiar to the land, structure, or building involved in which we are not generally applicable to other lands, structures, or buildings subject to the same zoning. The matter of economic hardship shall not constitute the basis for the granting of the variance. As you go through, one of the things that staff's report will talk about is how big this property was originally. When you talk about back in the 1800s, it was a, like three acres. Over the years, it's been subdivided. The graphics provided include lot four from the original plat of 1899. As the lots were subdivided, including 1221 Lang Street, the lots became smaller and now considered non-conforming to the LDR section 4.3.4K development standards. The subject lot now contains 53, well, let's just say 5,398 square feet, whereas 12,500 is required lot size for R1 AAA. Several of the surrounding lots retain the original structures from the 1930s. There is an established precedent evidenced by the approval of prior variances that the existing smaller lot dimensions found within the neighborhood provide unique conditions that result in difficulty complying with certain development standards that may otherwise be achievable. And I think this lot clearly fits that description. Uh, the next slide. That the little interpretation of the regulations would deprive the applicant of the rights commonly enjoyed by other properties subject to the same zoning. Uh, section 4.6.15 of the land development Regulations state that the pools may be constructed in a street side setback so long as the minimum side setback is at least 10 feet is maintained. Given that the distance between the existing perimeter wall and the building setback is only 1510, it starts to talk about how limited we are in space. And again, we're trying to create something that is unique to this house, unique to this courtyard, which is a very small area, 
and one that is actually charming and fits and is not going to be detrimental to the neighborhood. That special conditions and circumstances have not resulted from the actions of our applicant. I would tell you that our applicant only bought this home a couple years ago, that the 5,000 plus square foot lot was not a result of his, that saving this house is maybe a cause of his, but it's something that we should be talking about that we're proud of. So it's one that you start looking at these unique circumstances and say, you know what, this is justifiable, especially for this unique part of the Delray. Uh, staff has in here, there's already numerous existing setback nonconformities that are present on site. Independent of the particular request, the existing site conditions are not a result of the applicant's actions. That the granting of the variance will not concur onto the applicant any special privileges that is denied to other lands, structures, and buildings under the same zoning. Neither the permitted or non-conforming use, the neighborhood lands, structures, or buildings under the same zoning shall be considered grounds for the issuance of a variance. Uh, staff's analysis that the incorporation of a pool is not a special privilege and is instead a, common, a commonly uh, enjoyed amenity customary by homes in South Florida. While each variance request shall stand on its own merits, there is an established precedence for setback variances on the property as well as others in the adjacent vicinity that are predicted yeah, predicated on established facts that the lot pattern dimensions in this neighborhood provide difficulty to comply with the standard code requirements that may otherwise be easily accommodated on lots with more typical dimension profiles found elsewhere in the city. Uh, clearly we feel that you know if we had a lot that was 12,500 I'd like to think we wouldn't be here. So it really does go back to that lot size. <coughs> the reason set forth in the variance petition justify the granting of the variance and that the variance is the minimum variance that would make possible the reasonable use of the land, building, or structures. And therefore, you start looking again, what we're proposing, a five-foot wide splash pool and a small 15-foot, 10-wide courtyard. Uh, the applicant has also claimed that the proposed request is the minimum variance given best construction practices requiring a buffer between the pool and the building foundation while also maintaining functional use of the pool and adjacent patio space, which I actually did discuss during the presentation. Uh, lastly, but not least, um, that the granting of the variance will be in harmony of the general purpose and intent of the existing regulations and will not be injurious to the neighborhood or otherwise detrimental to the public welfare. Um, you know, to just state for the record, I do believe there are emails that are supporting uh, my client's uh, proposed variance tonight. The amount of the pervious open space will not be reduced further with the property maintaining the previously existing nonconformity figure of 24%. Lastly, the applicant has pointed out that the streets, which is directly adjacent to the proposed pool, is a low traffic, low street, providing access for only four residents. Um, that actually concludes our presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions should you have any. Thank you very much. If I could just make one quick comment before staff proceeds. Um, Mr. Eliopoulos brought up a good point that there were some emails received and so I just wanted to go back through ex parte communications. Um, I believe in front of you, you guys have the, the letter from Kate and Graham Hutchison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the letter from Robert Holland said. The letter from Marjorie Kuhn. Yep. And the letter from Frank and Sherry Mariani. And the letter from um, Max Weinberg showing Mark Schiller's message. And um, the, the letter received from Ken Kaltman. Um, so if you guys could just confirm, go down one by one and just confirm that for the record that you've also received those emails. Yes. I received the emails. I just comment that we, we didn't see them until tonight because no. they weren't ever put out by email to us on there was again no notice that may have been around for weeks but we didn't get the chance to read them until tonight right but but you've received them at this yeah. point they're, they're put into the record so I understand we had a couple of minutes to read them before the meeting only I've received them yes I have them and they're all positive uh, to clarify if I may the emails uh, what mrs. Weinberg and I did 
was speak to our neighbors because we do live in such close proximity before we even made this application. What do you think of this? Uh, is this something you would oppose? Is this something uh, you would approve of? And while this body is not uh, held to the standard of what other people say, we didn't want to proceed with anything that anybody would have an objection to. Uh, Margie Kuhn, for example, and her husband James lived directly next door. Um, and as Gary pointed out, uh, there isn't anyone who, even going up to the existing wall, would see this, this pool. Uh, and it's not, we call it a splash pool because it's not a regulation depth. It's more shallow, but safe. Okay. We're both ready to answer any questions anybody might have. Okay. We'll, we'll go staff. ahead with staff's presentation, staff presentation first, and then you? public comment, and then you can okay. ask them during board discussion. Okay. Uh, good evening again, board members. Julian Gadanik, Senior Planner with Development Services. Um, before you at this time is file uh, or agenda item 5C. Uh, it's 1221 Lang Street. Uh, the lot size is approximately thir uh, 0.13 acres. The existing use is a single family residence. The land use designation is low density residential and the zoning district is R1 AAA, single family residential. Uh, these are the adjacent properties for some context. And this is the subject property uh, view both from Lang Street as well as the, the side street. So the request before you is uh, consideration of a variance um, to land development regulation section, section 4.615 G1 to allow a pool to extend into a street side setback area, maintaining a setback less than the minimum required 10 feet to instead allow a setback of two feet and two inches. Uh, this is a rendering provided by the applicant that illustrates what they're proposing. Uh, and this is the site plan. Um, specifically, we're gonna be talking about the pool uh, and this uh, two foot two inch setback that's shown from the property line to the water's edge of the pool. Uh, that is the regulation in question that you're considering for today's variance. So uh, the code uh, requires a setback of 10 feet. Uh, it does, it, so it allows for pools in the side setback, but only if they're providing that um, minimum requirement. Um, and I wanted to illustrate where that would be on this site if the uh, literal setback was applied to this property and it's indicated by the red line and it leaves about seven feet from where the pool would begin to the uh, existing uh, wall of the structure. So if you take the, a pool of, of the same size and, and shift it down, you can see that it really leaves no room, if or very little room um, it can, um, relative to the existing structure. Um, and in conversations with the applicant's architect, they've advised that there are, you know, best practices in terms of construction and building that would uh, discourage uh, full construction of this type in clo this close proximity to the existing um, building wall. Again, this is another perspective the applicants provided showing what they're proposing. Uh, these are the findings which you will consider when you're um, evaluating the request. Uh, staff analysis has gone into detail in the staff report uh, on all of these, but I do wanna just highlight a few key points um, regarding these findings. The first one being that uh, the subject lot contains an area just over 5,000 square feet, whereas the R1 AAA zoning district minimum requirements today are 12,500 square feet. So that's to say that the existing lot is about the, a third of the size of what a typical lot should be in this zoning district. Um, and you, you know, if you have uh, limitations in size, it, it can be um, reasonably suggested that it might be difficult to comply with certain spatial requirements within the code uh, than you would if you had larger dimensions um, and, and more room to work with. Uh, this is the original plat. I've sort of highlighted the existing location of, of the property over time. It's gone from a very large property to a much smaller property through you know, subdivisions that have occurred. And as you can see with the aerial, many of the properties in this uh, district are of small size, but there are also some that are larger. And that's just to say that each property has its own um, challenges uh, or 
each property may have a more difficult uh, time than properties across the street or to the west or to the east uh, complying with certain requirements because they all have their unique sizes and, and limitations as far as how much room they have remaining. Um, uh, alternative would be to go in and demolish and start from scratch, which might make it a little bit easier to comply with some of these requirements. But um, with certain you know existing homes, especially if they have historical pedigree or significance, this one is not historically de designated. But um, you know if the, if there is merits to the architecture, you want to discourage that as a first resort. Um, so in those cases, you are limited to the amount of space you have left over to work with. So second point is that portions of the existing structure already encroach into the side street setback to a greater degree than is proposed for the pool. And the pool will be completely screened from view by uh, the existing perimeter wall. Uh, these are things that the applicant touched on in their presentation. Again, looking at the rendering and the street uh, view from the side street, you can see that there is a portion of the home that is essentially at the property line. I think it's around one foot away. And then there's that existing six foot perimeter wall that will act as a buffer from where the pool is proposed to the public uh, street. And it would, you know, essentially limit any potential visual impacts you would get from the pool because you likely would not be able to see it. And the third point being that a literal interpretation of the code would result in uh, limited remaining space for the construction of a pool. Um, there is no zoning regulation in the code that says a pool has to be X feet away from the building. Um, that's not something we can look to at for clear direction. It, it is left a little bit ambiguous as far as what that, you know, appropriate dimension is. Um, but there is some appropriate dimension between where the pool should be and where the building is. Um, in terms of maintaining you know, principles of safety and functionality uh, with respect to building code and construction. The applicant has expressed that they feel that what they're proposing um, is the minimum request to maintain those reasonable considerations for safety and functionality. Mm -hmm. And again, I just wanted to show where the pool of the same size would need to be located in order to avoid requiring the variance. And that is you know, right up against the building. So that um, would pose certain challenges, I'm sure. And yep, last, that concludes my presentation. Um, you can move forward to continue with the direction. You can approve if you find uh, the request consistent with the findings, or you can move to deny if the request is inconsistent with the findings. And Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any um, public comments? Anyone have any comments in the public uh, here? Okay. Is there any <coughs> rebuttal, cross-examination from the staff? None for me. Okay. Is there any rebuttal from the applicant? No, Chairman. Okay. Um, is there any cross-examination? Uh, okay, we got that. So now we're back to board discussion. Who wants to open it up? You mentioned you took into consideration the impact on the building wall and the uh, staying away from the foundation, I'm going to repose. What about the five foot wall that's just barely you know, eight, eight inches off the property line? Uh, have you looked at the impact of the foundation for that wall? We are going to be reinforcing that one. Uh, and, how, and it's a good question, because how I'm looking at it is, I, I hate saying it, but uh, even our best pool guys, they seem to take, uh, they have a leak. They like to use the autofill, so you don't know there's a leak, but there's a leak. And I don't want to see the undermining of, let's say, the house versus the wall, and that's why we chose that. But, but you are right, we are beefing that wall up. Fall over either. Yeah, yeah, no, we are beefing that foundation up. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Just out of curiosity, is there a setback for the wall that's been violated already? Uh, no, no, there's no setback regulation for the wall. There's height requirements dependent on where it's located on the site. Uh, this one would comply as long as, um, if they were building it new, there might be issues with visibility uh, in terms of where it's located adjacent to the garage or the driveway. Uh, but because it's pre-existing and it was, you know, permitted to be that way, yeah, they would. There's no site setback even for the building, or, you know, right adjacent to the wall either. That that's. Oh, that's old condition too? Correct, yeah. The, the building would have a setback, but it's legal nonconforming. It was. We did approve you know, a little change to the setback to allow them to do the previous construction, but 
minor. They were very minor. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly there is, like you said earlier, Mr. Weinberg, that we certainly got a really quality presentation many months ago, and it looks like it's moving ahead in a great manner. The fact that your neighbors uh, took time to write support, and obviously this is a very special project with such a minimal lot size, so it's nice to have these maintained and preserved. So uh, that's my uh, comment. Okay. Would you like me to go ahead and read the board order? I think at the time. Okay. Um, this is file number 2022-072. Property owner Max and Rebecca Weinberg. Address 1221 Lang Street. Request consideration of a variance request to allow a pool to extend into a street side setback area maintaining a setback less than the minimum required 10 feet to instead allow a setback of two feet, two inches. Pursuant to land development regulations, section 2.4.7A5, following consideration of all the evidence and testimony, the Board of Adjustment for the City of Delray Beach finds as follows. One, that the special conditions and circumstances exist which are peculiar to the land, structure, or building involved and which are not generally applicable to other lands, structures, or buildings subject to the same zoning. Diane, could you call the roll, please? Uh, Dumitrescu? Yes. Scott Clark? Yes. Carol Fredericks? Yes. Robert Cohen? Yes. Carlin Williams? Yes. That literal intent, um, I'm sorry, that's a 5-0 vote. Two, that literal interpretation of the regulations would deprive the applicants of rights commonly enjoyed by other properties subject to the same zoning. Ladu Matrescu? Yes. Con Clark? Yes. Carol Fredericks? Yes. Robert Cohen? Yes. Carlin Williams? Yes. That is a 5 0. <laughs> that the special conditions and circumstances have not resulted from actions of the applicant. Vlad Dumitrescu? Yes. Don Clark? Yes. Carol Fredericks? Yes. Robert Cohen? Yes. Carlin Williams? Yes. And that is a five to zero vote. That granting the variance will not confer onto the applicant any special privilege that is denied to other lands, structures, and buildings under the same zoning. Vlad Dumitrescu? Yes. Don Clark? Yes. Carol Fredericks? Yes. Robert Cohen? Yes. Carlin Williams? Yes. That is a five to zero vote. Um, number five, that the reasons set forth in the variance petition justified granting of the variance, and that the variance is the minimum variance that will make possible the reasonable use of land, building, or structure. Vlad Dumitrescu? Yes. Scott Clark? Yes. Carol Fredericks? Yes. Robert Cohen? Yes. Carlin Williams? Yes. Okay, five to zero. And number six, that the granting of the variance will be in harmony with the general purpose and intent of existing regulations, will not be injurious to the neighborhood, or otherwise detrimental to the public welfare. Vlad Dumitrescu? Yes. Scott Clark? Yes. Carol Fredericks? Yes. Robert Cohen? Yes. Carlin Williams? Yes. That is also a five to zero. And you guys have made positive finding as, findings as to all of the findings necessary. Um, so in that case, you would need a motion to approve the variance. Okay, because I want to do the motion. I move approval of the variance request 2022-072-VAR-BOA from LDR section 4615G1 to allow a pool to extend into the street side setback area, maintaining a setback less than the minimum required 10 feet, to instead allow a setback of two feet, two inches, for the property located at 1221 Lang Street. Second. Yeah. <laughs> you made the second? I'm in the second, Scott. Okay. Vlad Dumitrescu? Yes. Scott Clark? Yes. Carol Fredericks? 
Yes. Uh, Robert Cohen? Yes. Carlin Williams? Yes. Thank you very much, board, and Julian, thank you for working with us. Congratulations. Thanks for a good presentation. I want to thank you, too, on behalf of uh, Becky and myself. Thank you for your consideration in studying this. Uh, she'll be very pleased. So will my children. Okay, next is item number 219, Palm Trail. And Rachel Falcone is our city planner. Good evening, Rachel Falcone, planner, City of Delray Beach, entering agenda item 5D into the record uh, for consideration of two variance requests for 219 Palm Trail to allow a finger pier and a boat lift to extend beyond the maximum distance permitted from the property line to the waterway. Uh, and the applicant is here to give a presentation. And you're entering the full oh. file into the record, correct? The full file, it's file number 2022-115. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And if you could go ahead and do ex parte communications at this point. Okay. Yes, uh, board, does anyone want to please answer? Have you had any ex parte for uh, this matter? A letter, a letter from the public that were distributed by email earlier today or yesterday. Yes, I'm in receipt of the letters that were distributed on the dais. I also received a letter distributed today. Me too. I did also. No, I did Mr. Also. Scott, you've received the letter that they're talking about, correct? I'm not sure. Can I see it? Yes, of course. And there, there were the letters of support as well that they received. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Chairman, members of the board. My name is Matthew Scott. Um, I'm from the law firm of Danae, Miskell, and Backman, like my partner, Christina Belinke, who was up here a moment ago. Uh, we have an address of 14 Southeast 4th Street in the city of Boca Raton. Um, I am here on behalf of the applicant and property owner owners, I should say, Jeffrey and Shelley Lycozar, with an address of 219 Palm Trail. Um, uh, before we get into our presentation, I just want to sort of give an overview. This is a variance that, um, funny enough, is strikingly similar to the variance that my partner just presented a few moments ago. We're asking for a um, variance from the finger pier length requirements and the boat lift length requirements um, from the property line along the waterway. And the reasons why we're going to be um, asking for this variance, which you're going to hear tonight, is that there are existing conditions on site that make it impossible to safely dock a vehicle, uh, excuse me, a boat, uh, within the parameters provided by code. And so we're going to talk through that. I have um, um, Tyler Chappelle here tonight, who is the environmental consultant that is an expert in this field that's going to provide some testimony to you, right, because we have an evidentiary requirement to provide testimony about the issues at the property and our proposed solutions. As I said, the property is located at 219 Palm Trail. This is along the Intercoastal Waterway, a few blocks north of Atlantic Avenue. Here's another aerial photograph um, to give you an idea of sort of the neighborhood along the waterway. I think it's important to note that the waterway here is particularly wide, one of the widest spots of the waterway in the city. I believe it's over 200 feet, but Tyler will provide those details in a moment. The other thing that's really important that I emphasize is that this is a no-wake zone, mm -hmm. unlike a lot of other intercoastal waterway areas in the city. And so there are, no I'm sorry, it's, it's a not a no-wake zone, I should say. Excuse me for that. Oh. It's kind of a double negative. Wakes are permitted in this area, meaning boats can go faster, creating waves and making um, docking mooring vehicle, uh, boats more difficult. <clears throat> Here is another aerial looking at the property. We wanted to provide this because my clients bought, bought the home, uh, give or take, a year ago or two years ago and have been engaging in extensive rehabilitation and upgrading of the property. So they are working hard to take what was a, a home that needed a lot of work and make it a beautiful home. And this, this finger pier and um, boat lift request is part of them modernizing and beautifying this property. Here is another aerial. And then here is one more from the south. 
Here's the last one I, I will show you. <coughs> and so with that being said, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Chappelle, ask him a couple questions, then he's going to give you a presentation uh, offering evidence, competent substantial evidence, about why this variance, these variances um, are necessary. So let me just kind of help you a little bit. So Tyler, go ahead and introduce yourself, provide your address for the record, and then provide your experience, education um, in this field. My name is Tyler Chappelle um, with the Chappelle Group, 714 East McNabb Road, Pompano Beach. I'm here also with my associate, uh, Kat Bongerzone. Um, we're an environmental consulting firm. Uh, I've been doing uh, marine consulting, to single family docks, seawalls, and marinas for over 20 years, and uh, we do design permitting. Let me go ahead. It's better if I do that. And how long have you been doing? Um, Marine permitting, helping clients with marine structures. How many years of experience do you have? Uh, over 20 years. And uh, can you explain for us uh, the issues with this, with this property, the, the waterway, what gave rise to you, uh, us helping this client with um, pursuing these variances? Uh, yes, this property um, has a shallow water area in front of the existing seawall, as well as, uh, like we discussed before, the... Uh, intercoastal waterway at this section uh, is not a no wake, so there's high wave energy, um, which facilitates the need for uh, a boat lift, as well as due to the shallow areas, would need an extension of a dock that would allow the boat lift to go up and down and get the boat on and off of that lift as well. Um, and that's why we came up with the current design. And can you um, share? Uh, to the board what the the mean water depths are during low tide for for the um, area adjacent to the property Yes, so the contours here in the bathymetry shown on the exhibit existing layout um, You have a zero contour that is from the seawall out to approximately 20 feet and then you have a one and two Contour and our current design has the boat lift um, at the 2-0 contour So this is the um, proposed layout, and uh, it shows the uh, proposed finger pier and boat lift off of the um, southern side of the boat of the finger pier, and um, we're proposing uh, this also a marginal dock that runs along the proposed seawall. So the seawall that's there now is um, an existing uh, coral rock wall that needs to be um, rehabilitated and, re and replaced. So we're proposing a new seawall, uh, marginal dock, and finger pier and boat lift. The variance request this evening is uh, for the finger pier and boat lift. <coughs> and so now we're looking at a, a section for the um, proposed marine structures. But first, let's go back. What would happen if um, our clients simply installed a, a code permissible finger pier and boat lift? Uh, yes, if we met the code with the finger pier and the boat lift, it would be in too shallow of an area and would not be functional. It wouldn't have water at low tide, and therefore you wouldn't be able to access um, the vessel or the boat lift. And then what are the dimensions of the proposed finger pier and lift? Yes, so, so <laughs> I'm glad I wore my glasses. Um, the finger pier is five foot wide and it is 38 feet um, from the property line and the property line and wet face are in the same location and the boat lift is 12 feet wide and um, the total distance the boat lift is from the property line is 35 feet. So this is an aerial uh, with the bathymetry shown um, and the um, existing conditions um, with the proposed marginal dock. You can see the, the old U-shaped dock that's there now um, on the north side of the property and that'll be uh, removed and then uh, you can see the contours, how it relates to the channel of the intercoastal waterway. Um, to answer Matt's question before, the width of the waterway at this location is 294 feet. Um, from wet face to wet face. Um, this is the proposed conditions um, on the aerial as well. 
um, showing the distance not only across, but also the distance from the structures that are being proposed to the other side of the, the uh, waterway. So the finger pier is 254 feet um, from the end of the finger pier across to the other side of the intercoastal waterway. And then the boat lift is 263 feet. This is uh, just a recap on the variance request. Finger pier um, variance request is uh, for 13.2 feet and the boat lift request is for uh, 15 feet above the 20 and 25 and 20 foot criteria. And there's the table. Great. Thank you, Tyler. Um, so to recap, uh, code permits um, for waterways that are over 100 feet in width, a 25 foot long finger pier, and a 20 foot boat lift. Um, we're seeking variances from these requirements tonight to go to the, um, the bare minimum from that that would allow for safe mooring and docking of, um, of a boat there. So we're proposing a 38.2 foot finger pier, right? That, that's why it has this odd dimension, not 38 or 40 or 45, it's 38.2. Because we actually went to the granular, granular level of looking at the bare minimum we have to go out, right? To make it the mean, minimum deviation from code. And then the boat lift, which is attached to the finger pier, uh, we're proposing that that go uh, 15 feet in excess of the 20 foot required. Excuse me, permitted by code. And so here's sort of a recap of, of how we got here, right? And so um, it's important to note that all the structures that are being proposed will not exceed 30% of the width of the waterway. Um, as I noted, this is a particularly wide waterway area. So common sense, right, but also as verified um, by Tyler, the proposed marine structures will have no impact on um, navigation in the intercoastal waterway. Uh, we did share already that because of the, the um, low tide issues here and, and the lack of depth, this is something that is necessary, particularly during high wind events, in an area that does not have a wake. Um, and so if, as Tyler shared, if these variances are not granted and my client were to just simply permit a permitted dock, right, it would just be, it just wouldn't function, right? It just wouldn't work um, due to the low tides and um, the wind in the areas. And so what we're proposing is necessary um, for a um, functional mean structures, marine structures here. As my partner Christina mentioned during her presentation, my client, like all the other properties on the waterway here, have riparian rights which extend in parallel lines out from the, their side property lines. And those rights include the right to safely moor their vehicles, to have a dock, to have marine structures. And so um, based on our review, based on the con conditions on the property, um, these variances are necessary for my client to um, have riparian rights that others do in the area. And so here's the, vi the variance criteria. I'm going to run through them quickly just to recap. Sorry. Can't see the screen as well. First one speaks to special conditions, unique circumstances. Uh, I think that this is fairly apparent from our presentation. This is an area of the intercoastal waterway along my client's property line um, that during low tide, um, there is exposed rocks, exposed sand. There's no water there whatsoever. This is a special and unique condition. The next criteria would be that the literal interpretation of the regulations would deprive the applicant of rights commonly enjoyed by other properties subject to the same zoning. Uh, this is present here as well. This application does comply with that criteria because if the code is literally applied, uh, my clients would not be able to have a docker finger pier that would function properly. You're going to hear tonight from um, a neighbor that has concerns about our application. And I bring that up to just share that the neighbor to the south has a dock or finger pier that extends roughly the same distance what we're proposing tonight. I share that for, for a couple of reasons, but mainly because it evidences that it's necessary here to safely moor and moor uh, boats and marine structures. The next uh, criteria is that the special conditions and circumstances have not resulted from actions of the applicant. I believe this is fairly self-evident. My client purchased the property, is making various improvements to it. During that process, when they started exploring uh, redoing the dock area because it's dilapidated, it's old. It was discovered by their consultants, Mr. Chappelle here and his team, that they could not um, just simply replace what's there because of the um, low depths of the waterway. 
And then D, the granting, granting the variance will not confer upon the applicant any special privilege that's denied to other lands or property owners. Again, I believe this application strongly, squarely complies with that criteria because if these variances are not granted, my client will not be able to have a functioning uh, marine structure in this area to have a boat in their backyard. Uh, the next criteria is that the reasons set forth in the variance position justify the granting of the variance and that the variance is the minimum variance that will make possible the reasonable use of the land. And so again, I believe we, we squarely comply with this criteria because I believe what Tyler would share with you is that ideally, the finger pier would go out further. It would go to a deeper depth. And this, what, what um, is evidence in our application is that this is sort of the minimum necessary to make it work. And so they were trying to be reasonable in their request, and this is the bare minimum. And then lastly, that the, variant, the granting of variance will be in harmony with the general purpose and intent of existing regulations, will not be injurious to the neighborhood, or otherwise de detrimental to the public welfare. And so while letters of support technically are not required for variance applications, they're not part of your criteria, the fact that most of the neighbors willingly offer letters of support shows, one, that they're not concerned about it, that they think this would be a good thing. And then moreover, the fact that this variance will allow will protect my client's riparian rights, right, is something that, um, is, that we want to promote in, along these waterway properties. It's something that um, is acknowledged in the comprehensive plan and will only help improve property values in the area, right, because it'll allow another property to have a, um, a functioning and properly designed um, marine structure. Just to give you an update, for background, uh, we are going through the process of um, getting the required other permits from the other agencies. Um, we wanted to include the um, DEP permit because part of how we ended on the exact distance we're proposing was driven by FD FDEP saying, I'm sorry, Army Corps, requiring that we relocate the dock, uh, the marine structures in a certain way. So there's this ten, you know, uh, sort of back and forth between the two, and we landed on this being the, the, the minimum necessary. So with that, I think we've spoken enough. Thank you for allowing us this long presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions, and we're here. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that presentation. As stated before, the property is located at 219 Palm Trail in the R1A Zoning District and is surrounded by R1A, or R1AA and the Intracoastal Waterway. The variance request are for the finger pier and the boat lift to extend uh, beyond the maximum allowed distance. And the proposal is uh, for the finger pier is to request a 13.2 feet uh, extension and for the boat lift a 15 foot extension. This is the existing survey of the subject property and they do have a current dock on site and it's approximately 15 feet by 20 six feet wide um, and uh, the existing dock will be removed to accommodate the new dock and finger pier and boat lift on the subject property. These are the existing conditions on the left hand side. This is taken from the northern corner of the property and this photo is taken from the southern corner of the property. The proposed variances, just to touch on it again, um, Outlined in the red line is what is permitted for the finger pier, which is 25 feet. And the applicant is requesting to extend beyond the 25 foot to propose a 38 feet, two inch finger pier. Um, in addition, the boat lift uh, attached to the finger pier is permitted at 20 feet into the waterway and the applicant is proposing a 35 foot uh, or 15 foot extension into the waterway resulting in a 35 feet uh, from the property line. <coughs> the hydrographic survey that was provided um, shows the contour lines uh, along the property and um, where the proposed finger pier is located, it is in the uh, one to three feet mean level water, mean low water level. Um, and then the proposed boat lift is within the two feet um, MLW level. Uh, the required findings are in your staff report with the staff analysis, and um, this will be your means of approval of the variance. Um, 
but to touch on some of the analysis, the literal interpretation of the regulations may deprive the applicant of the rights commonly enjoyed by other properties <coughs> subject to the same zoning, considering that the low water levels remain at two feet, approximately 40 feet into the intercoastal waterway from the seawall. Um, it can result in difficulties navigating and docking a larger vessel. Uh, special conditions and circumstances have not resulted from the applicant uh, of the applicant. The hydrographic survey does demonstrate that the water levels are shallow at mean low tide. And the owner did purchase the property, which is located in the extremely low water level area adjacent to the seawall, so it is not a direct result of the applicant. Um, additionally, the proposed finger pier and boat lift are within the riparian rights area and um, are proposed in the mean uh, low water level area of two feet, uh, which is why they are proposing to extend the finger pier and boat lift into the waterway. And um, it can be determined that the variance requests are a minimum variance necessary for the use of the land. And um, the proposed boat lift and finger pier will extend beyond the maximum allowed distance allowed into the waterway. Um, and there will be an abundance of area within the waterway to navigate a vessel um, with the addition of the max of the distance. Um, there were public notices sent out to the uh, adjacent property owners within the 500 feet of the subject property. And um, it was posted to the city's webpage and in city hall. And that concludes my presentation. Okay. Any uh, public comment? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Would you state state your name and address? Okay. If you just hand it to the clerk right there. Thank you. Well, it's okay. It's easier this way, I guess. With the. <laughs> Do you have an extra copy? No, um, I don't. Sure. Okay. Can... We'll let you see it after somebody's okay. done. Uh, state your name and address, please. My name is Eric Platero. I live at 209 oh, Palm Trail, just south of the property. So I, I actually sent a, an email to the attorney, and um, the folks that bought the house to the north of me, they did approach me back in November and asked me, actually gave me a letter to sign off on approving the, the changes they wanted to make, and I, I told them adamantly I was against it. Um, one of the things, you know, when you see from the aerial uh, photos is you don't really see the perspective from down below. The, the depth of the water, if you look. I'm really sorry, sir. I, I may have just missed it in the commotion, but did you introduce yourself Eric and state Platero, your address? Yeah, 209 Palm Trail. So I've lived there about five years. But anyway, if you look at the depth of the water from the north to the south, it's about the same from the north to the south. And if you look at the pictures, I actually put them in order, but look at number one shows you the existing um, uh, pier that, or their dock that's there. It's on the north end of the property. There's no reason why they couldn't extend that out further right there. Um, but it just shows you that it's, there's an existing dock. It could go further out. What you're going to find is that they're trying to move it to the south end of the property. Picture number two shows you that that's literally 13 feet from the property line. Keep in mind, 13 feet from the property line, they want to put their boat lift, not the dock, not the pier, they want the boat lift to go 13 feet from the property line. If you look at picture number three, it gives you another perspective. Right from that, you'll see the aluminum uh, uh, fence between our two properties. That piece of PVC is hanging at 13 feet, and that's, if you can view where their existing dock is, which is on the northern end, they're trying to bring it all the way down on this side. Now keep in mind, the boat lift is gonna be on that side. If you go to the next one, it just shows you again a perspective from my point of, from my, from my um, uh, property line, how close this is. And, and as we're going through this, I want you to remember that your code, your code specifically states under intent, under docks, dolphins, finger piers, and boat lifts. One of the things that's, the purpose of it 
is to make sure certain waterways are navigable and it's not hazardous, but it also says, or deny the public reasonable visual access to public waterways. So I'd like to think that I'm part of the public. So anyway, as you can see in the picture that, you know, how close they're trying to get, that 13 feet, it's hard to tell from an aerial just how close that's going to be. So if you go through these, now I actually, there, that, that square thing at the end there with, that's got a float on there, that's 35 feet out. So 35 feet out, now that's laying in the water. Imagine this, a boat, probably a 35 foot boat being elevated on a boat lift on my side, my side, the south side of the finger pier. So again, if you go through them, you'll see how it blocks the entire view. Now, just so you know, to the south of us is, is Atlantic Avenue. So you have the, the road there. To the north, we have the view of the north. That is what we are doing, that's what we have. And if you look page by page, you'll see that's 35 feet. That's how far they go out. And just so you know, my pier is not 35 feet. It's not 30 feet, nor do I have a boat lift. So I, I don't know where they're getting these, their comments from. So this last picture is actually from my boat, from my, my dock, shows you how far into the water they want to go. Now keep in mind, that's in the water. They want a boat lift with a boat on top of that. All right, so I'm just giving you a heads up that what they're proposing and what they're telling you is, is, uh, is not 100% accurate. There's an existing uh, dock there now. That, keep it on sir, the north side. There's no sir. reason to bring it down to this side. Okay. Thank you. That was actually. All right. You can state your name, please. Good evening, Marty Perry. I'm actually here representing Mr. Platera, who just spoke to you, and I'm just going to make a few comments. Sir, on, uh, it, you're you're actually you guys are both put to the three minutes as as you are representing him. Um, it. At the board's discretion, they could give you a little bit more time if they'd like to, but um, it is, you are bound by the three minute public comment requirement. Is that, is that a peculiar rule here to the city of Delray Beach? And I've practiced here a lot of years and I've never seen that before. That's within our um, quasi judicial rules. That's actually spelled out in your rules. The council can't have his own three minutes. What was the first thing you said we could allow? I propose yeah. to cede three more minutes to the yeah, gentleman. Second. Yeah. We have a second? Mm hmm second. Okay, third. Okay. Okay, just let's just have a, a vote on that so that you can be clear that that was given. Would you call the roll, please, Diane? Vladimir Mitrescu? Yes. Scott Clark? Yes. Alec Hayes? Yes. Carol Fredericks? Yes. Robert Cohen? Yes. Garland Williams? Yes. Okay. All right, thank you. I Just briefly, uh, first of all, Mr. Scott made the comment that this is uh, uh, pretty much the same as his partner had presented earlier today, and I suggest to you that it's really not. Uh, the earlier petition uh, had a dock that was existing. Uh, they weren't extending it any further out. Whether or not uh, it was the subject of having been granted a variance previously is another issue altogether. I don't know the facts on that, but the reality is they weren't extending any further. They were simply removing a portion of the dock and replacing it with the, uh, with the lift. Uh, so there's, there's really a distinction between the two. And secondly, I suggest to you that the, uh, the reality, this isn't a question of riparian rights. We don't deny the right of this gentleman to be able to have access to the water with a boat. Uh, but the statute and the law doesn't require that he have the Queen Mary. It just says he has to have navigable access. The question really here becomes one of what size boat are we talking about? And that has not been brought up or discussed. Uh, the reality is when you start talking about the contours that were mentioned, those contours are dead mean low tide. And the reality is, is that dead mean low tide only lasts for a few minutes. The tides change over a 24 hour period, actually 24 and a half hours. Uh, so there, at dead low tide, there's rapidly increasing. If you look at all the photographs that you've seen here on this petition, every one of them shows water to the seawall. So the reality is, is there's water there. The question is, does this man have an entitlement to have water for the boat that he desires 24 seven at the expense of the gentleman next to him, 
who has to suffer through that additional time. And if you also look at the photographs that were submitted, you'll see that there are several other docks that have the same circumstances, the same conditions. There's nothing unique about his piece of property. They all have problems that mean low tide, but yet there are docks that meet the requirements. So the reality is if you're really seeking to have in a variance like this, the, the reality is the city should take a look at the ordinance as to whether or not the ordinance is not far enough out. Maybe we need to look at redoing the ordinance. Let's have public hearings on that issue and have a general public discussion because that's really what we're talking about here. The fact is, and I suggest to you, that they don't meet, possibly they might meet one of the six conditions that are required. They don't meet any of the other five. There's nothing unusual about their particular lot in relationship to the other lots along the intracoastal. And there are several other docks that meet the requirement. So the reality is he is asking for something extra. Secondly, I suggest to you that the fact is, is there's plenty of case law in the state of Florida that says when you buy a piece of property, you're subject to the conditions that exist when you buy it. He's not unknowing here. When he came here, he had a dock that didn't exist that far out in the intracoastal. It didn't suit his needs. He wanted something more. So he's really asking for something that's in addition, but he knew going in, he had a problem there. So I, you know, I suggest to you that there's more to this than meets the eye. They really don't meet all those requirements. I could take you down through them and waste your time, but the reality is, is that there's nothing special or different about his lot than the other lots. They all have to meet these requirements and he's asking for something that the rest would have to come to you and ask you for a variance in order to do what he has, wants to do. If that's the case, then you should change your ordinance. The ordinance doesn't meet the requirements of everybody. So I, you know, I could go down through them and they're all pretty much the same. So the, the reality is, is there's really not been a justification of the ordinance. There's no competent substantial evidence that shows that he meets each of those six requirements. It just doesn't exist. And that's what's required. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, staff, you have uh, comments? I do not. Rebuttal? You have cross-examination or rebuttal? No, I do not. Okay. Uh, applicant? Uh, yes, I'd like to um, respond to some of the things said. First off, I'd like to adopt for the record your staff report, right? Uh, Ms. Falcone did a great job, always does a great job in her staff reports, and she is the city's expert here, right? She stated in her staff report that her application meets all of the criteria for the variance. The variances. That's important, right? Because it's not just the applicant saying it, but your staff reviewed our applications, our materials in depth, and said that we meet the criteria. So that's the first thing. Second thing is uh, we prepared an exhibit that we didn't get the chance to include in our presentation, um, and I'm going to pass it out. Um, sir, the, this, the applicant is the party along with staff, and, and they are able to cross-examine and um, pro, they're able to cross-examine and rebut, but that's not provided to non-parties. And are they able to reopen the hearing and introduce new evidence? Sir, I believe that he is, is this in a purpose to rebut the evidence that has been provided? Right. This is just to, to address some of the things that were said. Um, but I, I'm happy to do it in rebuttal without the demonstrative aid if that makes everyone feel better. But it's correct that the neighbor's not a party here, right? So I'm not, I'm not litigating with the neighbor right now. Just trying to clarify some things because, um, you know, the neighbor has concerns and we want to talk about what the truth is. So rather than get caught up in minutia details of new evidence or things of that matter, Let's talk about the situation on the ground, right? The neighbor that is opposing the variance, the property obtained a waiver from the city commission in 2005 for a dock that exceeds 35 feet in length. And so what we have is a neighbor saying, you cannot do what my property has, right? And so the other point I wanted to make <coughs> is that, which I was going to show in the demonstrative aid, is that by right, my client is allowed to install a dock uh, excuse me, a finger pier and a boat lift that goes out 25 feet. They're asking for variances to go out to 38 feet. The angle from the neighbor's property is, of course, at an angle. So they're looking to the north. So understood that they don't love the idea that they may possibly have their view over the back of my client's property um, impeded in some way. But it's going to be impeded no matter what, by right, 
under code, there will be a doc back there. And so if, um, can you pull up my presentation? There was one other thing I wanted to share. Thank you. And so my understanding is the neighbor's primary concern relates to views, this idea that the proposed uh, variances will impact my, uh, the neighbor's view in the area. And so this idea of riparian rights is important. Um, the attorney for the neighbor talked about case law, right, which is always helpful to throw out there. And so I, of course, looked into the case law. And when we're talking about riparian rights, let me get to it for you. Of course, lots of, lots of courts have um, looked at riparian rights. And so here is sort of a seminal case on riparian rights. And what this case does is defines what is meant by someone has a right to views of the waterway. It is very clear under Florida law that someone's view rights, right, that the neighbor's right to not have to see a boat or a lift, extends in parallel lines behind their property. It doesn't extend to the left and to the right. Of course, right, because if that were the case, that it extended to the left and the right, then no one could, uh, could possibly install a dock or finger pier, right? Because they would always impede on someone else's view rights. And so courts have looked at this because, of course, neighbors have gotten into fights about riparian rights before. And they've ruled that your view, your right for a view, extends behind your property, right? If you were to do two parallel lines behind your property. And so the, um, the thing about which the neighbor is complaining is not something protected by law. Conversely, our application here tonight is protected by riparian law. It is a requirement under the law that my client have the right to um, safely dock their vehicles, to um, be able to safely navigate, and that is what gave um, rise to our variances tonight. And so just to recap, your staff found that in general terms we meet all the criteria for these variances. We presented expert testimony from Mr. Chappelle here on what the hardship is and why we need these variances. And so in light of the above, we would request that the variances are approved as complying with all the criteria. Thank you. No, you do not get to respond. You're not a party to this. To sir, no, no, sir, 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 sir you don't. we're not allowed to, you're not allowed to scream from the audience. I, he's the party and the staff is the party and that's why they're given the opportunity to cross-examine and rebut. Does staff have any? cross-examination or rebuttal? I do not, thank you. Okay. Sorry, I apologize. If I can just make one more comment, it's very quick. The distance from the property line is 18 feet, not 13 feet. Neighbor said it was 13 feet. It's important that you know that, that it's not 13 feet. Thank you. And I believe you answered this, but do you have any cross-examination? No cross-examination. Okay. okay. So we're here to our discussion now. Uh, Just a, a question. Um, is there a technical reason for relocating the docking position mm -hmm. further south? Technical reason. So the reason for the configuration is perpendicular because of the wave energy, it's um, safer for the boat to get on the lift perpendicular versus parallel. Does that answer your question? No. The question is, is there a technical reason why you've chosen a southern orient, a southern location than the original, the northern location of the current dock? There's no technical reason. No. Is there some preference on the part of the usability of the property or access from the house? I mean, obviously one case you have to walk around the pool, the other case you walk out of the building. I yes, disagree. certainly the configuration of the house and the renovations that are being done by the applicant would present that the access to the dock would be on the southern portion of the property. Because? Because of the design of the house. Could the dock be constructed where it is now, technically? The, as far as the configuration of the current proposal, um, the answer is yes. It, you know, you, the, the finger pier and the boat lift could be designed 
you know, anywhere up and down the seawall, but based on the access to it is, you know, bring coolers and that kind of thing to your vessel, you want to have it to the closest point to where that's going to be, and the south side is where that is. You stated that the other permits and uh, per permission from the Army Corps of Engineers is pending? Yes, we have applications um, with the agencies. The seawall has been permitted um, and the, um, by DEP, and we're pending the core. Um, we also are pending applications for the finger pier and the boat lift. And that's why the design, one of the things Matt was talking about as far as where we are and the, the length, we would like to go out farther, but we can't because um, the Army Corps will not allow a structure or vessel within 62 and a half feet of the edge of the channel. And we cannot go any farther for their criteria. So we're meeting their criteria as well as, you know, trying to find the middle ground as far as what can be functional and usable for the applicant as well as meeting the criterias. And the seawall, is it, you know, the city's been putting in new seawalls at much greater heights. Uh, is your seawall going to be yes, this greater will be, height than both yes, neighbors? Yes, absolutely. Um, that's one of the concerns with the applicant is because of the wave energy and sea level rise, we have water, you know, coming over the top of the wall. And do we appear between the wall and there'll be a, a walking area on top of the seawall, I assume? Correct. Yeah, the seawall caps three feet. How many feet? Three feet. Three feet wide? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it, what height is it? Required um, now. I can go. Well, I don't have the presentation. Cat, do you know six and AVD? Six and AVD, and before it was five, something like that. Is it only? I think it was lower than that. Four, four, no, four like three, four three something. and a half, yeah. Four something. Okay, and that would be enough, you think? Six, yeah. For a while. I yeah. Most of the, the um, cities are changing their codes right now, um, and the counties as well are recommending that right now the target is 5.0 NAVD through 2035. And this was based on a core study um, this past year, and then six by 2050. Interesting, okay. So um, another question. So there's really no uh, right away for the, except for the channel that you suggested. So where this pier is placed is basically up to the, wishes of the owner and uh, because there's no radical differences whether it's five feet left or right of this point it's lining up with that. the channel right the channel location runs um parallel if you will with mm -hmm. the right away um the right away being the property line for the intercoastal waterway and the boat will be docking on the side coming towards the neighbor the dock will be on the boat lift which is um perpendicular alongside the finger pier, yes. Okay. It'll be bow in. And it's supposed to be on the south side, always? I'm sorry? The, the lift, the lift is supposed to be on the south side? The lift is proposed on the south side of the finger, correct. I know, does it have to be on the south side? Does okay. it have to be on the south side of the finger pier? Yes. Um, based on the way it's configured, they want to have where, if you see the marginal dock, mm -hmm. they're going to have that and then step down to the finger. Mm -hmm. And that way it's easier. You can't, you can't have the boat on the boat lift and have the, the marginal dock because the bow will hit the rocks and the, the dock. So they were able to put the dock north of the finger pier and then the boat lift on the south because otherwise you can't, you'd have to notch that dock out and there's rocks under there too. So a portion of the wall has rocks uh, adjacent to the wall. And that's the other reason why we needed to go out. Right. There's, there's, there's also a problem with vegetation? No, not specific. No, we don't have uh, seagrass. Uh, uh, well, I say that we don't have seagrass at this time based on the survey that we did this year. Yeah. That's the other thing is, you know, the agencies are trying to, mm -hmm. um, you know, the shallow areas, they want to try to, you know, keep those and, and, you know, try to have the docks out beyond that so that you still have sunlight in those shallow areas so that you still have potential for seagrass to come in. Obviously, we're having a right. significant reduction in seagrass right now and the dying of manatees. So they're looking at that as well during their reviews. 
you mentioned that the dock is currently out at the furthest that it's allowed to due to the um, the distance from the channel. Correct. So what is the, you know, if you were to reduce it, what's the minimum in order to get your boat and your vessel into We're the We're right there. The two contour is right on the back, and that's why we have to go bow in because you'll hit, we won't be able to get the engines in at low tide if we went stern two. So it's, it's real close as it is. That's why I'm saying we would wish we could go farther out in that it would be you know easier to get in and out of that lift but um you know as it is it's going to be uh tough with you know low tide so there's dredging is not allowed in this channel dredging is is frowned upon um for the reason i just gave which is for seagrass habitat um so you know if we did dredge the other, part, the other downside of dredging is if you dredge the area where just the boat lift is, then you have a hole, which the agencies don't like. It's like a sump. And um, you basically would have to continually maintaining that hole. And they don't like the hole because what happens is silt sits in there and then nothing can grow in that silt sump, if you will. So, um, you know, that's, that's what we're up against. Sometimes you hear people talking, the captains talking about the swing when you're bringing a boat in. Does, if the tide's running a certain way here, does that, if theoretically, if the neighbor built a pier made at his property line, would you guys have an awkward situation bringing your boats in and out? If it was parallel, yes, but because it's perpendicular, it's actually easier to get in and out because um, they can pull right into the slip. If they were going uh, parallel to the dock, then they would have to come in you know from an, from the side and into the the slip um perpendicular is actually easier even with the tides and the tide you have guide poles on on the lift as well to help the the captain get get the boat into the lift either through wind action or you know currents but this is as far as perpendicular on a lift is preferred through parallels especially when you're in areas where you have high wave energy because if you're pulling in parallel to the dock on the lift that wave is hitting you on the side and throwing that boat this way whereas if you're coming in with the wave action it doesn't give you as much it gives you the back you know the bow and stern type of motion versus the side to side which it makes it difficult to get it level on a lift mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. your your drawing let me see if i can give you the upper title here uh sheet three of five shows, if I understand the crosshatch area, existing marginal dock, plus or minus 312 square feet. When I look at the photograph uh, that you have provided, I don't see any marginal dock in the photograph. What's the yeah, that, that was an error on our legend. That was it's That is what we have in our permitted plans. It's been permitted by DEP. That's why we showed it as an existing dock but that is something that still needs to be built but it's permitted so the length of it is not fixed because it exists at this time the length of the marginal dock right the length of the marginal dock is not being constructed correct that's kind of misleading because it implies it's there. That, that, that's what came the yeah, that was an error on our legend. We apologize. That was just because when we do our permit plans, we show it as existing. Um, when we're we're proposing something in addition to what's already you know been permitted, so it should have been previously permitted. But it so uh, okay. Right, but it shows. That's what's confusing when you look at. You have to build that, and that's what my question about it is. Well, and again, that's that's not part of the variance. So it, we're just well, yes, yeah. But it is because when you show that it's existing, that implies that that forces a location of the new finger dock, at the southern end of something, because it's shown as existing when in fact it's not existing and doesn't thereby constrain the exact location of the new dock. No, the, the marginal dock does not dictate the location of the finger pair or the boat lift. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, when I, there's a photograph, I don't know how I found this, um, looking south, 
from the existing dock, uh, which seems to me to show that the neighbor's dock to the south pretty well blocks this owner's view, the 219 owner's view mm -hmm. to the south, as well as the other owner, the 209 owner's view to the north. It seems like that you know they're going both ways. Yeah, I wanted to respond to that. So um, the the neighbor to the south that has concerns has um, pilings that are 48 feet out that were part of their waiver request, in addition to their 35 some odd dock, right? And so the logic of positioning the um, our proposed marine structures where they are on the southern side was because the neighbor's current marine structures already block the views in that area. Now, having said that, um, there were questions I heard about, does it have to be where it is? And uh, it's important to my neighbor, uh, to excuse me, to my clients, that, that they, they be reasonable here, right? And so they'd be willing to move both structures to the, so let, let me go back. Our variances tonight are to allow encroachment eastward, not for the specific locations of those structures, meaning they can move, they can toggle if these variances are approved to the north and south because it'd be a variance for the marine structure in the back. Having said that, my clients would be willing to offer f on the record that they would revise it to move both structures, all of them seven feet to the north to address the concern and be reasonable here, right? Um, because they, you know, it's, we, I don't know that we, th we believe that the neighbor's concerns are, are founded, but we're trying to make this the most palatable request possible because it's so important to my clients here. So I just wanted to share that. So I ask the attorney, do these become part of the record? Does that mean that that's what we've approved, what's shown on the drawings? No, you would, you would be approving the variance um, solely. But if, if, the, um, if the applicant, I, I would recommend that if you were going to do something like that, it would be more beneficial to continue with direction um, to a date certain so that they could bring back that application with um, with their new drawings. Um, yeah, so, yeah, and, and when we do company. say mm -hmm. that we continue with direction, we do like to give the applicant the benefit mm -hmm. of making a decision of whether they would like to continue with direction or they'd rather just have a vote so that, um, mm -hmm. you know, it completes it on the end of the Board of Adjustment and it can move forward if it had to, to um, an appeal. Thank you. I have grave concerns about the current placement given the uh, commentary that was provided tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and may I add, this is a picture of your existing doc, right? Or is that the applicant? Sorry, your... I didn't get the benefit of seeing those pictures. That's his doc. So, so I, I don't see any, you suggest that you needed a, a better way to get up to your boat to put the coolers on. It, it doesn't look like anything's blocking the whole way there, though. So I don't know how, um, what would constrict some compromise. I guess compromise is the word that I'm looking for. And it sounds like one of the options that my colleagues were just speaking about uh, would allow both parties to uh, have a win-win here as best that we can. And so we would ask to continue with direction then. We would ask to continue to give us an opportunity to revise it. Mm -hmm. and, and we, sometimes I think our, they can compromise on our part as quick as we can to get you back in here too. So um, we're not here to delay by any means for a reason except um, good for everybody. And again, that's my opinion, I think. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Well, I ask for your leadership in this one. I do want to make sure that you guys understand that your, your direction is being given because for some reason you... It needs to be within the reasons for the variance, um, that there's some condition that it's not meeting because of certain locations. So as long as that's accurate, um, you can make a motion to continue with direction um, to um, a date certain. And I think that would have to be asked of Rachel. Um, yes, that, that would be okay to move to a date certain. Mm -hmm. Is there a time that you guys could both um, 
it would be I would be glad to speak to that more thoroughly though the um, provision that I have exception to that I'm struggling with is that special conditions and circumstances exist peculiar to that particular particular parcel of land structure or building <clears throat> and I am not an expert in um, marine geology or anything but it does appear that there's nothing different about this particular parcel to me so I'm, I'm struggling with that yeah and if you feel that continuing di with direction and allowing them to bring back more material that would show that um, would be beneficial to you guys, then you can go ahead and continue with direction if they can agree to a date to set it for so that um, so that you guys have an exact date so it doesn't have to be re-noticed. Sure, the, the next BOA meeting would be held on May 5th. Um, would that be sufficient time for the applicant? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And does the applicant feel like you have the direction you would need, and then they can go ahead and just make the, the motion to continue with direction? Yes, I, I think what, what, we, what I was gathering from the questions was that there's a feeling that if we move, um, move the structures to the north some amount, that that would, that would be more of a sort of compromise type thing in consideration of the neighbor's concerns. And so we'll, we'll look at where we can move it. The only thing I would share is, you know, it, it, there's a limits how much we can move it without generating concern from the other neighbor and that also has stuff. So we will move it as much as we possibly can and, and work through that. Thank you. Okay. okay so how do you want to phrase this? You guys can just do a motion to continue with direction as provided to May 5th. Mm -hmm. That's a date certain? Do we have to say that or not? May, uh, just the next meeting? Do we? Uh, you just need to say the exact date, which is the May 5th Board of Adjustment meeting. Go ahead, sir. I uh, move we continue with action on this variance subject to the applicant revising the presentation and the details of his variant, variance request resolve issues expressed by the board tonight with the direction to return on May 5th. Second. Second. Okay, roll Jerry's call, please. Second, the do, do we have it all? Who made the second? Me. Fifth. Oh, whatever. <laughs> Vlad Dumitrescu? Yes. Scott Clark? Yes. Mike Hayes? Yes. Carol Fredericks? Yes. Robert Cohen? Yes. Carolyn Williams? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank everyone. You thank you. Okay, is um, there any other further business? No more items, I don't believe. Um, no, no, no more items, and I don't have any comments. Staff for tonight. comments. Okay, then I call the meeting adjourned. Uh, do you have any board comments, real quick? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I think you, everyone did a very good job okay. with their insights. Well, my, my only comment is when there's additional. You know, public commentary like these le emails that came in, if an effort could be made to get them out to us instead of five minutes before the meeting, it would help us out. Because I download everything days in advance. As soon as it comes out a week ahead, I download it so I have time to study it, and five minutes is not necessarily enough. I, I, I would love to be able to <laughs> help you out on that one. Uh, but it, it I've been doing this 20, uh, almost 30 years now, and it is pretty regular that you will receive email we will receive emails right up uh to almost the beginning the start of the meeting yeah i understand that Scott, but these are dated march 8th and some of them apparently were written a while even before that so i you know if it was dated yesterday i'd understand but according, you know, according to the paper package fair enough eight, they would have handy because we did get some from the uh, the neighbor 209, I just got an email about that I think yesterday or today. 
which is but that was a very recent one, I understand. But the others are much older, that were for twelve twenty five, and we didn't really see them in time. That's fair. That's they fair enough. Said the same thing. Yeah, that's fair. It didn't really matter a whole lot, but still. I'll, I'll speak to Steph about yeah. that. And um, my comment would be, in this scenario, when the neighbor he doesn't get any more than the three minutes. No, we're not looking I, to I would just that. not, I don't want to talk about the specific okay. item, but as far as the rules are considered, um, the, the applicant is either the applicant or the applicant and his representation and the representation speaks. Mm -hmm. um, and that's within our quasi judicial rules. Um, so there's a max three minutes per person. If you're representing an organization and there are six people that can give you their time, then you could have up to six minutes. All right, so that's, that, and that was changed not too long ago, I think, wasn't it, Scott? Did that become? Our, I, it's, well, our, after, our, over 30 years, it's <laughs> floated back and forth. But uh, yeah, it has recently, within the last two years, in 2017, we did the original quasi-judicial hearing rules were changed, and it did include that portion about um, party status um, not being recognized as um, pursuant to case law. Um, but there also were some changes to the quasi-judicial rules very recently that put in that 20-minute requirement, um, and that was just adopted like uh, a couple months ago. I remember so. now reading it when the and the other, should, should we keep our packets with us then till the next meeting uh, of all this information? Sure. I mean, I'd like to. Uh, it, Instead of having to print it all out again. <laughs> okay. Some, and these photographs. Diane, do you have these photographs? Were you given a copy of the I photographs? Have them. Yes, Scott gave them to Okay. Me. You're, you're giving yours to her? Uh, no, I gave I gave Okay, you, so you, have, you, you guys have one now. Do you need Perfect. another one? Yeah. I mean, it's no, we're good. Okay. Just for the record, thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, and then we're off record, and everybody have a great Easter next week. Thank you. Thank you. And the, can we repeat the date again, Diane, that we're coming back? May 5th. The May first Thursday of May. May 5th. May 5th. May 5th, okay. Thank you. <laughs>